All right, folks, I apologize for the delay. We are live on YouTube. We're bouncing an awful lot of light back at you. Test, test. So Danielle, are we, uh, this sounds different. Are we, are we out to the world now? Okay. Okay, well, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, Kim, would you please take roll? Senator Anderson. Here. Senator Furphy. Here. Senator McEwen. Here. Senator Pappas. Here. Senator La uh, Chairman Landon. Here. Okay, committee, the first uh, House bill for our consideration tonight is uh, House Bill 190, Vehicle Titles for Non-Resident Owners. And we have Representative Brown here with us to maybe describe this bill. So take it away, Representative. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry you have to see me again, but uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I know you've got we a love couple having. other... We, I know you've got a couple other bills, so in an effort to try to expedite your time, I will keep my explanation of the bill um, relatively short, but I want to explain exactly what we're doing with this bill to make sure there's no confusion. So, Mr. Chairman, this bill is coming from a constituent concern. Uh, this constituent owns a large vehicle dealership here in Cheyenne and performs what they call courtesy deliveries. When a car is purchased out of state but then given to a driver in Wyoming and it's delivered at the local dealership. The dealer performs this as a courtesy, hence the courtesy delivery. You know, they're not making any money off of it. They didn't buy the vehicle there or anything along those lines. Well, after delivery, Mr. Chairman, what happens is this individual will take the vehicle down to the county clerk's office and attempt to uh, title the vehicle and license the vehicle. And for what, what you have to have is in order to license your vehicle, you have to have a title. Well, what they have in their hand is an MSA. Um, it's basically a, a, it's a title, if you will, but it's the cert or MSO, I'm sorry, a, a manufacturer certificate of um, origin. And so basically what you have is the inability uh, when they walk into the clerk's office, the clerk has this defined piece of statute that says you have to be a resident of the state of Wyoming in order to license your vehicle. Well, what we have happen here is certain companies, let's, let's use State Farm, for example, they don't actually have a State Farm company here in Wyoming. What they have is a whole bunch of agents that are registered. And so when you have a massive hailstorm or anything like that, and they need to deliver some vehicles out here, and let's say it is a, an insurance vehicle, they'll purchase that vehicle, have it drop shipped to this dealership, and then they go to license it. And the county clerk says, hey, my hands are tied. My hands are tied because state law says you have to be a registered agent with the secretary of state and you're not. So that's what this bill is attempting to fix is basically allowing these courtesy deliveries and this titling work to occur here in Laramie County and across the state. Um, what you have, the bill is very, very simple. It allows businesses who operate a vehicle within our state the ability to title and license their vehicle. We currently allow for licensing, but we do not allow for titling. This bill fixes the titling portion. We are currently missing out on millions of dollars in tax collection as well as vehicle registration fees. South Dakota, one of the neighbors that I have been modeling and looking into this with, allows anyone from anywhere basically to license their vehicles. 
uh, Mr. Chairman, what I have been able to find here is 22 out of the 23 counties in some way, shape or form uh, allow some level of this out of state titling because it's not that big of a deal. Unfortunately, what we have found is there's some legal interpretations in the current statute that uh, restrict um, Laramie County, for instance, has a tough time uh, allowing this and actually simply just does not allow this. So if you go to the bill, Mr. Chairman, I will walk you through again, a very small one page bill. If, if I could have fit it all on one page, I would have. But if you go down to uh, lines 11 through 15, it's any non-resident person registered as a business entity under the laws of another state in the United States over onto page two and who operates a vehicle in the state for business or commercial purposes for which no Wyoming certificate of title has been issued may apply for certificate of title for that vehicle at the office of the county clerk or if available electronically. And then Mr. Chairman, the uh, exemption that you see down here is says vehicles of non-resident owners, um, no certificate of title shall be issued for vehicles of non-resident owners titled in another state. And then you see what we add in there, the new language, it says, except authorized by what I just read to you. So Mr. Chairman, what this is attempting to do is basically open up the ability for businesses who have registered entities um, elsewhere to come license their vehicles here, pay their taxes here and take care of business here. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's bad customer service when a person walks into our office and they are told by the government, no, you can't do business here because you're not a registered agent. There's some conflicting issues. The person's just trying to do their job and just trying to get it taken care of. So they go down to Colorado or they go over to Nebraska, take care of the business, and we lose out on the tax revenue and the registration fees. That's all this bill is trying to correct. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll stand for any questions from the committee. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate that. Uh, committee, questions? We're to bring her the bill. Mr. Chairman, if I may, Representative um, Brown? I do know that our Laramie County clerk is here as well as the titling clerk. And I also have the constituent who brought this forward to me uh, is here as well. And then if at the end, if you guys do have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to assist in the back at the end of public testimony. Thank you, Representative. If you, if you can stay, uh, that would be terrific uh, in case we do have a question, but uh, we're going to go to public comment mm -hmm. and we'll go first to those in the room and uh, then we'll check uh, on Zoom. We'll go room and then Zoom, Mr. Vice Chairman. So, well, they're, they're jumping up. Okay. Coming up, aren't they? Who would like to testify on this bill? Uh, don't be bashful. We'll be good. Okay. So, please come forward. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm Mary I'm here representing in the County Clerks Association. And I have the Honorable Deborah Lee, who's the Laramie County Clerk, and her deputy, Misty Tinney. And we just have a few comments for your consideration as uh, you would review this bill. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. It's, the uh, by the way, it's good to see you even at different committee. But I know. Yeah. It was joint corps before, huh? Yeah. 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 We spent some quality time together the last couple of years. But yeah. Anyway, thanks for being here. <laughs> Please uh, continue. Thank you. County Clerks Association of Wyoming would like to provide the following points for your consideration. As currently written, the bill opens the door for virtual businesses with no physical presence in Wyoming to title both used and new vehicles in Wyoming, including those businesses that are attempting to evade sales tax fees and emissions and safety standards in their home states. There's no guarantee that sales tax for these vehicles purchased out of state will be remitted to Wyoming, particularly in the case of leased vehicles or those purchased in a state with which Wyoming has a reciprocal agreement. Persons doing business in the state are already required to register their vehicles in Wyoming. Under current law, a non-resident working in Wyoming must register a vehicle in Wyoming and be issued Wyoming plates regardless of the origin of the title. Businesses operating in Wyoming, such as the Union Pacific, energy companies, et cetera, currently are able to title and register vehicles in Wyoming because in Wyoming because the owners have a physical presence in the state. House Bill 190, if House Bill 190 becomes law, the clerks believe that it would may have unintended consequences for Wyoming, including the potential to open the door to titling fraud, salvage or unsafe vehicles. 
It could promote the titling of vehicles of businesses that only exist virtually or companies that may never do business in Wyoming or drive on Wyoming roads. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's basically the notes and the, and the talking points that we sent to you. Uh, it looks to be an issue of whether you want to extend the opportunity to uh, do courtesy titles or not. This is kind of the downside. You've heard the upside. Um, I have backup, can answer questions if you have any, and we're ready to stand for question. Committee questions for Ms. Langford. Uh, Senator Anderson. Um, Mr. Chairman, so what's a downside of registering these vehicles for virtual businesses or whoever that don't participate in the state and run on the roads and that kind of thing? Ms. Lankford or Ms. Lee? Um, just apologies, get, get Mr. Chairman. You're good to go. Trying to figure out the. Mike, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm Deborah Lee, I'm Laramie County Clerk. And as Ms. Langford said, we do have our titles manager here. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Anderson, you asked about registering vehicles and that is the function of the Laramie County Treasurer who registers those vehicle vehicles. Our office does the titling, which is the vehicle ownership. So currently any a uh, business could who does who operates in Wyoming and uses Wyoming roads can register the vehicle through the county treasurer's office. Senator Anderson, Mr. Chairman, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't say that question right. I, I just wonder what the downside is of any of these businesses, either titling them or registering them or whatever you want to do, and they don't use our roads and they're not here. What do we care? Sleep. Well, I'll use the example of um, if it's not really a business and it's, let's say, a salvage vehicle or a, a fraudulent vehicle, it, it kind of it leaves the door open for that sort of thing. Um, as well, I want to go back to the issue of the taxes. Um, Wyoming already has challenges with trying to prevent our own residents from crossing our northern border to register and title vehicles in Montana in order to evade the sales taxes. Mm -hmm. So it would appear that we're sort of doing the same thing here. So Mr. Chairman, we wouldn't collect the sales taxes on these vehicles? We just get the registration and the some sort of fees? Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Anderson, were you talking about under this bill or? Yeah, if, I if believe we, he is, Ms. Yeah. Lee. Okay. Just, in other words, we're just trying to, I think, drill down. If, mm -hmm. if I can kind of join in with the Senator here, we're trying to, to drill down and get exactly what some of the downside is to the bill. Appreciated your information. Okay. We're just trying to, yeah. trying to understand as well as we can. Um, Somebody shows up with one of these uh, vehicles. Um, tell us a little bit about the process and what uh, what is the downside? What? Tell us your concern again. Thank you, Senator. Um, I mean, Chairman Landon. Um, I can tell you what our office experiences. Um, the situation we generally encounter is we'll have Wyoming-based drivers or operators of a company vehicle. And these drivers and owners don't own the vehicles. And in most cases, those vehicles are leased. And legally, a vehicle owner on a title has a right to sell or trade a vehicle, of course. And the drivers and operators we're talking about do not have those rights. Um, one of the things that we encounter is that if it's a leased vehicle, we find that most of those sales taxes are going to another state in the case of a leased vehicle. Another situation is if a vehicle was purchased from a state with which Wyoming has a reciprocal agreement, those sales tax taxes would also not go to Wyoming. Committee follow-up, go ahead, Senator Pappas. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I, I, my, my question is, um, Obviously, this went through the other body, the the, the House, and and through its um, committee. Um, 
were there, and I, and I see the bill came to us as a white bill, so the committee didn't make any changes. Um, were there, was there any, um, any effort to amend it? Because you, you said as the bill was written, you have issues. So I'm assuming there, there are ways to actually to, to hopefully fix it in your mind uh, or, or make it better. Um, did you try to bring anything to the to the uh, House committee? Uh, did you testify before them? Uh, and if you did, was there what was the discussion there? Um, Mr. Lee? Chairman, yeah. um, Senator Pappas, uh, we didn't offer any amendments. We just were pointing out the concerns that we had with the legislation as it was written. Um, I would say the intent is probably laudable of this bill, but the execution is not. Okay. Questions for Ms. Lee or Ms. Langford? Uh, uh, go ahead, follow up Senator Pappas. I guess I, that's, I, I, I'm trying to get at, hopefully, uh, um, if the intent is, of the bill is good and there's some flaw in the execution, perhaps there's something we can amend into this bill to make your life easier or palatable anyhow. <laughs> uh, uh, so anyhow, please be thinking about that. Should we pass this on? Um, I don't know whether we'll come up with an amendment tonight, probably not. Uh, I haven't thought about it long enough, uh, but certainly if it passes out of this committee, we, can, we could certainly see it on a, at a committee of the whole uh, amendment to, to make it better if it does pass out. So just think about it. <laughs> We would always welcome any any feedback. Um, is what Senator Pappas was saying. So, uh, committee, anything else for these nice ladies tonight? Really appreciate it, um, Senator, Senator Furphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I'm a little confused about the whole issue, and I'd like to pin this down since I agreed to sign off on this bill. Um, so the issue is when someone comes into your office with an MSO saying they acquired the vehicle out of state, but they now have the MSO and they want to title it in Wyoming. And what you're saying is they may have paid the sales tax to another state and then we're not collecting the sales tax, but they're asking us to issue a title. Um, but they're going to be using our roads, et cetera. Am I understanding this correctly? Ms. Lee? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, may I call on our titles manager to get down into the, Absolutely. the expertise of this? And I apologize. I missed your name on that quick introduction to start. So if you could give us your name and your title, that'll be, that'll be great. Absolutely. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I don't think your microphone. Do we have oh, green? Green means go, by golly. And then I'd ask you to get, get a little closer to that, and then okay. we can all hear you. Thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Um, again, my name is Misty Tinney. I'm the auto titles and UCC manager for here in Laramie County. Um, now, you're asking if it's in regards to an MSO. The way that this bill is written, it is not specific to a brand new vehicle off the MSO. So it would appear that it's both used vehicles as well as brand new vehicles. Um, if it is a purchase, obviously with a state that we do have a reciprocal agreement with, Wyoming's never going to see that those funds. If it's a lease, um, a lot of those leases that we've seen come through, looking at those lease agreements, they're actually being collected within that state that it was purchased. So it's not being collected or sent to Wyoming if, in fact, the vehicle is ever going to have a presence here in Wyoming. Um, I can go a little bit further and actually give you an example of um, what I came across actually this morning, which was a company out of California. Um, they've got a fleet of trucks. And what they wanted to do is um, get everything done here um, and do more of a virtual type business 
with the knowledge that they're never going to step foot in Wyoming. As the conversation went further, we were able to boil down to the fact that the majority of these trucks were not going to meet California admissions. And so that's what we've been coming across quite often is the California emissions um, as well as Colorado emissions. Um, and they don't really like to pay the fees in California either, um, but those are kind of two of the more popular things that we've come across. Senator Furphy, follow up. I think all that makes sense, Mr. Chairman. Um, so what you, okay, let me clarify. So you've got a used vehicle that comes into the state. Are they bringing you the title from the vehicle from another state and asking you to title it in Wyoming? Am I understanding that right? Ms. Key, go Mr. ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Yes, what they would do is they would actually bring us um, that out-of-state title. Um, we would require them to go get a VIN inspection done through law enforcement just to make sure the history of the vehicle is okay, it's not been stolen, those types of things. And then we would go ahead and, and as long as everything is okay, move forward and get the, the vehicle titled here. Now, if it's a used vehicle and it was purchased out of state, of course, at that point in time, sales tax was more than likely already collected, say if we're just, if we're just changing the name or what have you. So there again, Wyoming would not be seeing that, that revenue there either. So just as a follow up on that point, um, I'm sorry to be riding a slow horse tonight. Why do they want that title in Wyoming again? if it's already titled somewhere else? Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's actually a couple of different situations with that. So if it's a, if it's a brand new purchase, as written here in the operator is here, um, and they go through, say the vehicle is purchased from a dealership in another state. What happens is when, they're, when the vehicle is delivered here, it would be delivered to one of the local dealers. And then that dealer would do what they call a courtesy deliver, delivery and basically do all the paperwork and, and work on helping that individual um, get that vehicle titled here. Senator Pappas. Now, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, what I heard was that you know, the, it, the big issue was that there was um, these titles come here and, and because they're trying to avoid something in their state whether it's emissions or whatever. And I guess in my mind, what does that matter to us? Uh, you know, I, I don't really care about California's laws. And I mean, we don't have emission standards here and we don't, have, we don't inspect our vehicle. So what do I care that, that they're trying to evade something in California? Ms. And, Keen, what, what does uh, Senator Pappas care? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Well, um, I'm just wondering. <laughs> not sure I can answer that one very good, but um, I guess, you know, the one thing to be looking at would be, you know, if we had, you know, unsafe vehicles on our roads, obviously, because of the fact that we do not have um, those emission testings here. Follow up, Senator Pappas. Well, I, that's true of any vehicle that's on our road. We don't inspect our own vehicles. And, and so I don't know how we can hold somebody else's vehicle at a higher standard. I, 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 I'm just failing to see this. Don't problem. you think? I think. <laughs> don't you think? The question was, don't you think? Yeah, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't no. you agree? Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure there's other folks that'll want to weigh in on that as well. Uh, anything else, committee? Or, uh, Thank you for being here, you guys. Uh, really do appreciate it. And, and if you can stick around, we would appreciate it. We might have a question a little later. Uh, Mary, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lee. Thank you for being here. Um, we're gonna go to further testimony in the room. Um, Mr. Winnie. From God's country. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Bill Winnie, Sublette County. Uh, I think the military 
the way those things work with military people may provide some insight for the committee. Uh, the issue of titling and paying taxes in many states are just two separate transactions. Uh, for example, I bought a, uh, a Suburban in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, they titled it, gave me plates, but I paid no taxes on it because I was a resident of Wyoming, which I had been since 1978. Went out to Nebraska, same thing again, went out to the island of Guam, Guam plates on it. Still have one of those plates in my garage. Finally came back to Wyoming after that, titled it in Wyoming and paid the taxes at that point. And that's the way the laws work for military guys. Similarly, I had another car I bought in Virginia, um, had a three day transit pass to get it to a shipping point to get it uh, and then sent it out to Hawaii, titled it in plates in Hawaii and then later brought it back titled it and taxed here in uh, uh, Wyoming uh, as a result. So uh, I, I think that may provide you some insight if you could separate the two transactions of titling and taxing. Uh, some states uh, have no tax for military guys. Other states will ask you to show that you paid the tax at some point. So keep your receipts. Uh, if you can show that you paid the tax when you first titled it, they don't ask you to do it again. Um, so that's a thought for you. Um, the military guys also, you might say, because you got the guys out, out here at F.E. Warren, you might, you might consider just making it a tax-free transaction unless they're a Wyoming resident, something like that. Um, I heard mention of, the, of people up in the northern part of the state licensing vehicles up in Montana to avoid tax. One of the things you have to consider that I've seen in other states is where do you principally garage the vehicle? I mean, if they do it in Montana and they garage it in Montana, most other states I've been in would say, well, that's legitimate. Now, there's some things you're gonna have to work with for that because they may not really be garaging it in Montana. And, and if they're not, then they should do it in Wyoming. But that principal garaging thing might also provide some, <clears throat> some insight for you. Um, subject to your questions, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Winnie. Questions for Mr. Winnie. Thank you for being here, appreciate oh, it. Oh, uh, Senator McCune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought we had a state statute in Wyoming. If you're a resident, I think you have 60 days to register the vehicle in Wyoming with Wyoming plates, uh, unless you're exempt, i.e. military. But I think right. anybody else who moves here only has 60 days to get Wyoming plates on it. Well, with regard to that principally garaging thing, that may be a wrinkle to it that I, I can't speak to directly, but... Uh... Uh, I've seen that in other states where if you principally garage it somewhere, that's where you pay your taxes on it. So you may have to work that wrinkle. I'm not the right guy to get into the, the next layer down of that layer cake. Okay, thank you, Mr. Winnie. Follow up, uh, Senator McEwen. Good. Okay, Senator Here's Pappas. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we're, we're, we're talking about any non-resident person registered as a business. So we're talking non-registered people, non-residents. So. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Please uh, state your name and who you're with. And uh, for the record, thank you. Hello, I'm Brian Terrell, Terrell Chevrolet, Terrell Honda, Terrell Ford. Um, I asked Landon to bring this bill. Last year, I did over 100 courtesy deliveries in our community. Average cost of $50,000. That's $5 million in cost. My brand new vehicle. That's three hundred thousand in tax revenue that left our state last year because they didn't want to accept a check. These courtesy deliveries come to the dealership. They want to pay the sales tax here. They want to pay the registration fees here, the title, everything, and we had to turn them away. I still got paid. That's one thing, Landon. What isn't correct on this is. I do get paid to do these. Why isn't the county? Why in the state? 
we've left a lot of money on the table. I'm one dealership, did a hundred. The easy fix to, to this is to change MSO and title and just say MSO. You got two years that uh, uh, new vehicle is exempt from any uh, emissions issues. So for two years, we've got good cars running on the, the, the state highways that have paid our tax that we shouldn't have a problem with emissions. My issue is why are we turning away money in a downtime that Wyoming's facing? Stand for any questions. Mr. Terrell, thank you. Um, committee questions, Senator Anderson. Yes, Chairman, I have a question. If you are doing the courtesy thing for that car vehicle and it's your person that goes there is a Wyoming resident, why, why do they not collect the tax from him? Why, why is it that he's a, he's a resident and he's registering the vehicle? Why don't, why don't they go ahead and he, register he, it and tax him? Mr. Chair, um, it, he or she, he or she yeah, excuse me. is a um, employee of a company. The company owns the car. They've bought this car for them to use in the line of business. And uh, the company is still going to get, you know, it's going to be titled in the company's name for this driver. That, that customer is not going to be, that driver is not on the title. It's the company. And what started this was Hartford Company in Maryland um, isn't licensed in Wyoming. And, and uh, um, you know, we, we left, we had the check. They wanted to pay. They, they want to be a part of our community. Their people are here or a pharmaceutical company. Uh, us Wyoming dealers do not have an opportunity to sell these cars. These are cars that are bought um, back east, down in Texas for the oil companies. Um, so uh, we have an opportunity to collect sales tax because the, the, part of the paperwork with the MSO is the, the check for sales tax for whatever county they're deciding to go to. Senator Anderson, follow up. Follow up. So does this bill do that for you? Does that, does this? Absolutely. This it doesn't do it for me. It does it for the state. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Senator Pappas. So, so Brian, you don't think it needs to be tweaked at all? Just the language as I, is. I think the only thing you can change. Yep. I'm sorry. Nope, that's all right. I think the only thing you can change is MSO. I like the garage thing. If you look at every lease uh, from every manufacturer on a lease, um, you pay tax where it's garaged. So you could have somebody that's living in Texas. Um, but the car is going to be garaged in Wyoming. That's where that um, lending institution will collect the tax for where it's going to be garaged, not for where the company is at. That's typically how it goes. Go ahead, Senator Pappas. Does that also include on on uh, uh, who they pay or insurance rates change depending on where you are? Does, does, does the insurance also based on where it's garaged? I'll go ahead, Mr. Terrell. I would assume so. However, we're talking about very large companies that are probably buying their insurance at bulk rates, and it really doesn't matter. So, Mr. Terrell, it sounds like there's maybe a step or two more that the committee going forward could take a look at. Um, it's, it sounds like this is a good first step. Is that what I'm hearing you say tonight? Like I said, the only thing I would change is that, uh, not title to put MSO. That's it. And garaged. If it's garaged here, I said, I'd hate for us to keep losing sales tax. And that's what we're losing right now. Well, we appreciate you bringing it forward and appreciate the representative working with you. Uh, committee, anything more for, for Mr. Terrell? And if, uh, if you could stick around tonight, we'd appreciate it while we work this bill, because we might have a question for you later. That's All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Brian. Thanks. Uh, anybody else in the room like to come forward and testify? Anyone else in the room like to testify on uh, House Bill 190? 
I'm going to uh, go to the Zoom then um, and um, see if Director Reiner of the Wyoming Department of Transportation would like to join us. And um, if, if he or some of his folks from MyDOT have any input. Good evening, Director. Thank you for being here. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Luke Reiner, um, Director Wyda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're comfortable with this bill as it's written. Uh, it really, uh, we can support either way, but, but really um, at, at this point are fine with this bill as it is written. Okay, thank you, Director Reiner. Any questions for the director? Okay, let's, let's move on to anyone else who would like to testify who is with us electronically tonight. Um, if you'd please raise your hand so that we know to bring you in or Danielle, maybe you could ask for that. It doesn't look like we have anyone. Anyone else like to testify? Okay, back to the room tonight. Uh, anyone else like to testify or follow up on what they've said? Okay, let's go back to the bringer of the bill, Representative Brown, bring us home on this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, very briefly, um, Senator Pappas, I think your remarks were spot on um, on the emission standards and stuff like that. Uh, the way I see this is Wyoming is actually benefiting from those states' standards. Uh, when this kind of stuff happens, Wyoming gets to title a vehicle. And, and what I want to be clear on is this bill does not, I, I think we're conflating the issue of taxes and titling. And I want to be very cautious on that because this bill does not deal with anything to do with the taxes or anything along this. What this bill does is it clarifies in statute that a non-resident business can title a vehicle in the state of Wyoming. Now, what that does subsequently after approval of this would allow county treasurers to then collect taxes on a vehicle that has been titled in Wyoming. Right now, the vehicle is not being titled in Wyoming. It's being titled in Colorado or being titled in Nebraska, mainly that I'm aware of. Um, and then it's the taxes and everything are being collected in those states. Um, I can tell you that I did speak with Mr. Terrell and I also um, had reached out to um, the, the Gillette area, the Campbell County area, and they do this a lot for mining equipment. Uh, this is a pretty common practice for mining equipment and there's no issues up there. Um, so one of the things that I think it, it's very critical to know on this is we're just talking about titles. We're, we're not talking about the sales tax. We're not talking about the collection on that. And I think once it gets to the floor, there could be that discussion. But this is simply asking or stating that a business can title a vehicle in the state of Wyoming, regardless if they are registered with the Secretary of State or not. That's what we're doing with this bill, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you guys are interested in the amendment, um, I personally, as you said, it, it's a white bill sitting here at your desk. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do used vehicles either. Uh, you are talking about businesses that are doing this. I, I don't see a major flaw in this. However, if the committee is so inclined to change this to uh, strictly doing new vehicles with MSOs only, um, I'm sure I could work with the attorneys to get a get an amendment drafted and, and bring it over to you for committee of the whole. But Mr. Chairman, with that, I have plenty of notes and plenty of anecdotal stories, but I will spare you that and let you move on to two man train crew. Thank OK, you. Thank, you. thank you, Representative. Any questions, uh, committee? OK, Representative Brown, thank you. Uh, I'm going to close public testimony. And uh, what's your pleasure on this bill, committee? Second. Uh, moved by Senator Furphy and seconded by Senator Anderson. Discussion. I, I like Discussion. the bill just Senator like it Anderson. is. I, I like the bill just like it is. I, I understand that MSO part, but. Uh, oh, thank you. I understand that MSO part, but uh, I think that lets out the used vehicles also. So I think, I think we ought to pass it through like it is. Well, and I think that's something we can follow up on, I bet. The <coughs> yeah. law firm of Landon and Landon can maybe work on that one going forward. Um, any other comments, Senator? Senator Furphy, anything? Are you ready for the question? Kim, would you take uh, roll on House Bill 190, please? Roll call vote, House Bill 190. Senator Anderson? Aye. Senator Furphy? Aye. Senator McEwen? Aye. Senator Pappas? Aye. Chairman Landon? 
Aye. Five ayes do pass. Sweet pie. Okay. And um, <laughs> Representative Brown, do you have someone to take that out on the floor for you? We've got. Chairman, I believe Senator Murphy agreed to it, and I'll also have Senator Hicks. We're already right behind him on the chamber floor. You know, he's he's got Senator McEwen right behind him. So, yeah, we'll we'll back him up. Okay, Senator Furphy, thank you. Okay, committee, the sec the next bill for our consideration tonight, House Bill uh, 254. Um, Mr. Chairman, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Walk Chairman. us through Members this fine committee. House Bill. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be working off of the engrossed copy. Okay. Um, which I think makes life easier for uh, the committee. Um, a little bit of background, mainly for those uh, who forgot or aren't familiar with the situation. Um, the Department of Transportation's computer system is ancient. Uh, put in in the, in the 80s, uses a language known as COBOL. Uh, I think they're only literally in this building maybe a half a dozen people who've ever used that language, uh, myself oh, being one of them. what that is. And that it, it was way before mice and everything else. And, and if you see old movies where they have a little blinking cursor in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, that's probably a COBOL system, uh, which really haven't been produced for many years. The problem with the system is it's getting used, it's getting old, it's getting worn down, along with the people that... Uh, know how to handle it. I, I think right now there are two people, one in a contractor, the, the system resides uh, at a facility uh, in Nebraska, and there's a contractor who can do it and a, a state employee. Both of those people are really wanting to retire. Um, I think the department has forbid them from doing it because you can't find expertise in that area. So that's a background on the system, why it needs to be replaced. That system houses all of the state's vehicle records, uh, driver's records, and other things, and is used by numerous, uh, both in-state and out-of-state uh, government agencies, along with third parties, along with uh, the individuals in Wyoming. If you need uh, a copy of your driving record or want to renew your driver's license, it goes through that system. Um, and with that, uh, if there are no questions, on that little bit of history, I'll go through the bill. Um, Just, uh, Mr. Chairman, real, real quickly before you yes, go into the bill, uh, as you list uh, those entities that are contained therein, uh, there are some outside agency folks that uh, take advantage of this system too, is there not? And maybe you would get to that later in the evening, but Mr. Chairman, there are, and I, and I can cover that now because that is included in, in the bill. There are outside agencies, vendors, uh, insurance companies when they want a copy of your driving record. Uh, these companies you see on TV that sell your vehicle maintenance and repair history at, can I, or access that system. Um, it's also accessed for taxes. Um, I can show the committee, and I didn't bring enough copies, but I'll show the committee a brief chart that I've referred to as Octopus's boxing of all of the interactions of this system. Um, but suffice yeah. it to say, there are other entities that tap into this system all the time. Correct, dozens actually, um, both in-state, out-of-state, federal agencies, um, law enforcement agencies, everyone uh, has a has a role in this, it seems. So with that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, yeah, please continue. I'll go through the bill. The bill um, is a personal bill uh, intended to uh, fix some of the issues we found with the previous House Bill 24, which was a committee bill. Um, and a little bit of history on the bill. The bill went from a personal bill directly referred to appropriations. They would have to look at it uh, anyway. And if you look at the bill number, it was developed late in the legislative session, and thus uh, I'm the only person on the bill. Um, so what it does, page one, is, is creates an, an account to put the money in uh, for this and indicates where the money goes. It's continuously appropriated. Um, page two, line six, department can accept uh, gifts, contributions, et cetera, uh, or federal funds for the system. Now, previously in that, if you look at the original bill, uh, there was some mention in there of CARES Act money 
And as are both the, the House and Senate Appropriations Committees have asked, those were pulled out. They will address that at, at a potentially a special session. So uh, section two is, is really the, the real guts of the bill, the real important part that says, not later than July 27, the Department of Transportation shall replace the revenue information system. And the reason it's referred to as a revenue information system is originally it was in the Department of Revenue. Department of Revenue did some work, replaced it and said, here, YDOT, you can have it. Um, and then the Department of Revenue has moved on to other things and uh, our Department of Transportation has the system now. Um, and says that the department shall use funds from any appropriate source to fund the replacement um, and that they can apply for any funds that become available. And that again would be CARES Act or ARP funds or any number of the other acronym programs. Um, in B on page two, it says that they can charge fees and increase the fees for these vendors who are into the system with half of those fees going to fund this system, the replacement. And when I asked what fees they were getting, I indicated that a company that, that has a little cartoon animal as its kind of logo on TV is paying about $5 for each check on a vehicle. And frankly, that sounds awful low. Uh, I've heard rumors you can't even mail a letter. A company can't mail a letter for $5 anymore, the cost of preparing it. So Letting a company in there for $5 who then sells the, in effect, sells the information, I think they ought to be able to set their own rates and some of that money should go to the computer system. Um, and then it goes on to section three and four. Um, section three really sets up a framework to do this. Um, and I, I'll digress here for a minute. I don't think there is a really good number on what it will cost to replace this system. I've heard as low as 36 million, as high as 80 million. Um, and until we get in there, the state would get in there and start doing the work, that cost is gonna, is gonna be very flexible and, and in flux. Um, I tend to think it would be on the lower side of those numbers, other people feel it'd be on the upper side. Um, and, I, and I will say that the, NCAR supercomputer is being replaced uh, and that will put a person on, capable of putting a person on Mars and bringing them back safely. And they're replacing that computer for 35 million. So I would, I would think a YDOT computer would be a little less than 80 million. So that's just my own personal opinion. That's true. Mr. Chairman though, they don't have to pay for any hotel rooms up on Mars or anything like that no. though. There's some yep. extraneous expenses that you might want to factor in. Okay, go ahead, keep, keep going. Okay, so what it does is section three sets up a framework whereby the Department of Transportation would work with um, uh, ETS, Enterprise Technology Services, and the Computer Sciences Department at the University of Wyoming in finding a replacement for this system. And that the three of them would be involved equally with the Department of Transportation leading this effort. And, that, and that's the, the gist of, of section three. It lays out uh, some of the things they have to do, including um, using nationally recognized standards for computer security um, and all the information that will be stored in there. That's covered on page four. Um, on page five, um, consult with public and private partners who will access and share information. And those could be sometimes federal law enforcement, state law enforcement. Um, they shall create a, create a committee to do that review uh, with no more than 12 members and those members coming from um, ETS, Department of Transportation, um, the legislature um, are spelled out on page uh, six and on to page seven. Um, no later than, than July of this year, um, they'll provide to the Joint uh, Transportation Committee and Joint Appropriations Committee uh, proposed timeline for each phase. And I know that is very quick uh, compared to how government usually does things. But to me, this system, it's been long enough that we haven't fixed it. It's to me a, an urgent priority. 
Uh, if we lose that system, it goes down uh, and is not repairable. We've pretty much lost all of our vehicle and driver data. And one thing that would mean is if you lose real ID on your driver's license, the only way you'll get on an airplane is to go out and, and get a uh, passport, which is much more expensive than your driver's license. Even though you only renew it every 10 years, uh, I really don't want to tell the people of Wyoming to go get a passport in order to fly to see grandma in Florida or something. So, um, and with that, um, that pretty much covers uh, what the bill does. I will say that uh, the original bill had a, a small appropriation in there uh, by adding a $5 fee to each driver's license renewal or license application and $5 for each uh, vehicle registration. <clears throat> uh, those two items were removed from the bill in the house. Uh, there was some uh, pushback on having additional fees in there, so they were removed. And I uh, have given the committee a, a copy of a proposed amendment if you wish to put the, the fee back on, on the driver's license. That seemed fairly palatable in the house. The once a year on uh, vehicle registration was not. And that's the reason for that. That would be up to, to the committee to decide if they'd like to do that or not. Um, so and, that, and there's no direct appropriation in this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Senator Pappas. Yes. Uh, um, uh, Chairman Burkhardt, what, what, uh, do you have an estimate of what that would uh, generate in the form of uh, uh, income? Chairman Burkhardt. Mr. Chairman, Senator Pappas, approximately $4 million a year, and that, which would go into the fund uh, again to fund the computer system. If you look at this timeline of a year to kind of get up and running and then five years to implement, you'd be looking at, at $20 million as a, call it a seed account. Committee, uh, Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman. Did I understand that right? The five dollar fee for driver's license would bring in four million. Is that was that your question? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Anderson. Yes, approximately yeah. four million. Okay. And just, uh, Chairman, just to uh, uh, clarify, we renew our driver's licenses. We go in to to pay that five dollars every five years. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? That is correct. Dollar a year. Dollar a year. That the vice chairman figured that out for me. Well, Mr. Chairman, he's correct. That's really good. <laughs> so, well, uh, Representative Burkhart, thank you for bringing this. I would ask that you maybe hang tough with us uh, as we work the bill, uh, go to public comment. We, we may have further questions. So, uh, I'd stick around, Mr. Unless, chairman. Committee, if you've got anything, we'll keep him here for a minute. We good? Senator Furphy, we do have questions, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Burkhart, um, what about allocating some funds? It seems to me this board that we're forming here should travel to other states to find the state of the art in these systems and Along those lines, I think we should make sure we have a lot of over capacity to deal with the future, because I think this is the way our highways are going to go in the future. So I'm just asking about doing the research on the state of the art of these computer systems. Thank you. Senator Furphy, thank you. Chairman Burkhardt, what do you know about other states and what they're up to? Have you had time to do much? Uh, research on that front. Mr. Chairman, I would, I know that the department has that in detail. Other states have upgraded their systems. Um, some have used dedicated systems that they've had in effect developed for their own use. Others have used off the shelf computer equipment. I think the intention here would be to use off the shelf stuff and eventually go to a, a cloud-based system. Uh, Senator Furphy's comment about a, an appropriation to bring outside consultants in, I think that would be part of the bidding process to invite them in. 
the bill does require that they they ask and and include the the input of uh, public and private users. Um, but there was no appropriations on this again. Um, the main reason being is frankly to get it through the house. So that, chairman on that front, and then I'll go to Senator Pappas. He's got a question, but just to follow up real quickly, what was the conversation in appropriation? This bill went directly to appropriations, just not much flavor to, to put any seed money in there at this point. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Mr. Chairman, that would be correct. Um, appropriations uh, like the, the two appropriations of $5 on driver's license, $5 on vehicle registration. Uh, however, like I said, I did, those, it was felt would not get through the house. And that was part of the reason. I, I think the system needs to be replaced enough that I was more interested in getting the bill through than I was worrying about the appropriation at that time. They did put in all of section uh, three was uh, appropriations uh, contribution to this. But again, no direct appropriation other than that $5 fee, which both of them combined would have generated about $8 million a year. So, and if the committee wishes to go all the way back to the original, um, I can share the original amendment, which you would just put back in in effect rather than, than leave it out of the engrossed copy. Thank you, uh, Senator Pappas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I was going to bring this up after we were going to discuss the bill, but since we talked about it, and that's um, with what type of software we're looking for, um, Section Three, um, page three, eleven, uh, you know, paragraph A there, where it says the Department of Transportation, um, Wyoming Information System shall be purchased or developed, configured, and implemented. Uh, I, what, 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 what I have a fear of is, is what we just experienced a few years back with the, uh, the issue with PTSB. And if you recall, uh, ETS decided they were going to develop their own software. You recall they were, it was kit of parts, you know, these Lego things that were talking us about and that we're going to, all the licensing boards, we're going to be able to like get in to here uh, and, and PTSB wanted to, wanted to use a off the shelf product for $350,000. No, we decided to give ETS $1.7 million, which they quickly spent, hired a company. Uh, if you recall, that company went bankrupt after uh, spending all the money and we now, don't even use a system that what it would the product they got was less capable than yeah. than the three hundred fifty thousand dollar product. We spent one point seven million. So I I'm 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 really gun shy about us trying to develop our own. Uh, and so um, hopefully um, I, I don't know if it's something that I'd like to see changed in here, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I don't want to say developing software anymore. They, they've proven they can't do that. That's not our expertise. Well, Senator, it Thank comes you. back for our approval, I think. And Mr. Chairman, you were probably going to say that uh, it's going to run. It's going to run back through the transportation committee, I believe. Uh, but points well taken, Senator. Uh, Senator Anderson, you Ch had another Chairman, question. If I might, uh, go ahead, Chairman Burkhart. And, and Chairman, yes, I do agree. <laughs> um, one thing is, is the testimony from ETS is that their preference is that they want to buy an off the shelf system, that that is their, their preference, uh, to keep all the state stuff going. And I know exactly where Senator Pappas is coming from. Uh, I remember when they wanted to buy laptop computers and were quoting a price when I was on appropriations and I was looking at the same from one of the large box stores. Uh, that was two hundred dollars a unit less. So I, I understand the the concern. I'm, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, I'm having a hard time with the math. If I divide that that five dollars into four four million, I get eight hundred thousand uh, licenses. Uh, 
and I'm thinking that my math is off somehow. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, uh, that's a number I'm going off of the original uh, fiscal note on uh, House Bill 24. Um, and that number could be off. I, I admit that. Uh, but remember, in addition to our driver's license, we also have identification cards in there uh, and those sorts of things. So there may be some other things. The, the list um, on licenses is, is extensive. So some people may, may have two, driver's license, regular license with a motorcycle endorsement and, and those things, CDL licenses. So and others. Representative so that, that number could be off a little bit. I, I'm hoping that maybe uh, the Department of Transportation can clarify that for us, but that's a good question, Senator. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Senators? Okay, Mr. Chairman, we'll let you sit aside for a minute and we're going to go to the uh, Director of the Department of Transportation. So if we can let the good Director in. Director Reiner, welcome back. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee again. Uh, really, some, some comments from us. And I, I am joined tonight by Mr. Rossetti and, uh, and Mr. Babbitt. Uh, let me first uh, start by, uh, you know, complimenting uh, our chairman from the, the House side uh, on his understanding of the issue and, and, and thank him for, for working this. Um, he is correct. Uh, the system certainly does need to be replaced. In fact, it was actually the very first issue that I was hit two years ago uh, with when, uh, when I came over uh, to this department. And certainly we need to, need to do something. Uh, in terms of, of this bill, and maybe I'll let me just address a couple of the, the questions and comments uh, that came up. Um, we are uh, already working extensively with uh, ETS. And, and that um, gives me comfort in the ability to meet the tight timeline. If we were starting from scratch, it, it, it would, uh, my recommendation to you would be to push that back. It'd be too big a hill to climb. But with where we at are in the process, where we're at in the process, I, I'm, I'm not too worried about that. Uh, we worked extensively over, as most of you know, over the last many years actually, with an outside consultant by the name of Math Tech to uh, design, um, not design a system, but, but to evaluate the products that are on the market and determine which uh, direction to go. Your comment about uh, a cot or a common off the shelf system is correct. We are not interested in somebody sitting down and writing code. Our interest is a proven performer because we don't want to get this, we do not want to get this wrong. Uh, the, the stakes are too high. Interested in, in, in a system that will stay current every year and that will be updated. And I, and I suspect it, it sits on the cloud, but those are all becomes technical issues uh, that, that are out there. I, I would remind uh, the committee that last year, the, the legislature actually, um, uh, uh, wrote a bill and, and hired a consultant to come in and evaluate um, what we were doing uh, in terms of these products. And that, that report was issued uh, late last fall by a consultant by the name of Barry Dunn. And, and what they said is that YDOT had, was executing due diligence in this path forward to, to select a replacement again uh, as the director um, that, that, that created sort of that easy feeling, you know, or, or help allay some of the fears uh, of, of spending this much money uh, on, on the system. So, so the fact that an outsider said, hey, good job, due diligence, keep working with the ETS, drive on, uh, gave, gave me uh, some comfort. In terms of uh, the working with the others, I, that's fine. We'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll um, gather the team and 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 work to achieve that. the The revenue issue is is certainly something that that should be discussed. Um, Chairman Burkhart does have a good memory. Um, the it, to to refine the calculus that Senator Anderson you ask about in terms of fees. 
So if you go back to the fiscal note on House Bill 24, um, which had the $5 increase in licenses and in vehicle registration, about 830,000 came from licenses, about 4.2 million uh, was the residential registration. So those two certainly came to the five. And then we actually, uh, because of the proration on some of the IFTA stuff came up with about $2.1 million extra, um, which, which was helpful. And so, so the total on the fiscal note on the original, the original bill was about 7 million broken down into the five, which is sort of a whammy portion. And then and then the seven uh, correction, the two, which was uh, a prorated uh, some of the trucks. So, Mr. Chairman, I you know we I could talk this a lot. Um, I, I think uh, what's helpful here for me is that we've recognized the issue across uh, the our committee, and and I'm thankful for that. And 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 we do need to take the steps to fix this. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will either stand for questions or be happy maybe to see if Mr. Rossetti or Mr. Babbitt have something they want to add. Let's, uh, committee, before we go to questions for the director, uh, let's let Mr. Rossetti in, in case he has a comment or two, and, and then we can, um, if we have questions for either one of the gentlemen. Mr. Rossetti, welcome tonight. Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, Taylor Rossetti, Support Services at YDOT. Um, I, I just stand for any questions. I, I, I would clarify the, the point that the director did make on the fiscal note for House Bill 24, that the driver's licenses alone would, would generate the 830,000, as, as Director Reiner mentioned, just, just so that the committee's clear on that. And with that, sir, I'd stand for question. Committee, questions? Uh, Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, did I understand them to say the driver's license would bring in 830,000, not 4 million? Mr. Rossetti, if you could break that down to us, how do we get to 4.2 million? Yeah, M M Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Anderson, um, Ch Chairman Burkhart does absolutely have a great memory. And, and as, as Luke mentioned, if we go back to that original fiscal note, so as we talk about driver's licenses, a $5 raise to the driver's licenses transactions, as he explained them, would generate $830,000 per year. That's based on an average of 166,000 transactions per year. The $4.2 million would be the estimate based off of resident vehicle registrations. And then there's an additional estimate of 2.1 million that would be generated if we added this to the prorate registrations in the international registration plan. So, so the, the breakdown of that original fiscal note is roughly 4.2 million for resident vehicles, roughly 2.1 million for prorate vehicles, and 830,000 for driver's licenses. And that's based off of a uniform $5 fee added to all of those transactions. Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, would, would all of those go to this computer system or is that just informational and only the $5 fee would go to the info into the computer system? Mr. Rossetti. <clears throat> Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Anderson, as Chairman Burkhart mentioned, currently there is no appropriation sitting in that bill. Uh, Mr. Rossetti, uh, to clarify our director, uh, if the intention would be that if those fees had not been stripped out of the bill, that it was going to go into this account. Uh, director Reiner, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, uh, that is correct. So as, as the bill was originally written, all of the about $7 million, really the five that we talked about, which is eight it, and the two would all go into the bill, which I, I tell you for us is helpful because, you know, the money will come if it doesn't come from an outside source, either through um, a fee of some sort or through some federal pot of money that we could find, some other pot of money we could find, it will come from some existing program in, in, in our department. Okay, thank you, Director. Um, Senators, anything for the folks at YDOT tonight? Senator Anderson? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Director Reiner, thank you uh, for being here. If, if you guys can stay on, we really appreciate it. In case we have a question 
uh, that comes up. Um, appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, anyone in the room that would like to testify on this bill. Please come forward. Ms. Langford, absolutely. Yep. Good Mr. Evening. Chairman, yeah. Mary Langford representing the County Clerks Association. Um, I'd like for you to put on your old uh, corporations hat. I can dig it out. Think, think yeah. back on that. We would really like to encourage you to support this legislation. Um, in Wyoming, our voter registration system is supported. There are four agencies that vet voter registrations. And this particular system is one of those through YDOT. Um, when a person applies for voter registration, this information goes through that uh, to, because it is a real ID. Um, so it helps us to establish citizenship and those types of things. Uh, the other agencies that it goes through is DCI to determine whether the, the applicant is a felon, uh, goes through vital statistics to make sure that they're alive and also goes through social security. So um, RIS is really important to the county clerk's work and to the integrity of the state's elections because it's one of the vetting uh, parties that, that looks at voter registration. So again, we'd encourage you to uh, support the legislation. Ms. Langford, thank you. Uh, appreciate welcome. that. Any questions for the county clerks tonight? Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, anyone else like to come forward on House Bill 254? Representative Blake. Good to see you back. Citizen Blake now. Yeah. <laughs> Always a representative. There you go. Once a rep, always a rep. There you go. Uh, turn the microphones on. The, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Blake, uh, thank you. Uh, committee, you know, I served on that House Transportation Committee with most of you. And uh, I've seen that chart that uh, Chairman Burkhardt showed. It looked like five octopuses wrestling each other. This is a system that is going to fail. And by at least creating this account, we can figure out how to put some money in it later. You guys can figure out how to put some money in it later. Guys and gals, excuse me. I'm not sure about that part, Mr. Blake. We well, <laughs> but I just want to say I support that. I've uh, heard, read about this issue in the past years and I would ask for your support, Mr. Chairman. Questions for uh, former Representative Blake and, and former committee member. Mr. Chairman, I was just testifying as a private citizen on this bill. Um, I know that. It's, I appreciate that, Mr. Blake. Thank you. And it's always great to see you and good to have you back in the halls. Anybody else like to come forward on House Bill 254 before we go to anyone who uh, is on our... Is there anyone else in the room? Please come forward. So, <laughs> well, come on forward. You're always welcome to the Hi. microphone. Tammy? Chairman Landon and members of the committee. My name is Tammy Johnson. I'm a resident here in Laramie County and a former um, person who worked hard to secure education funding. And so I just wanted to point out the kind of confluted ne nexus here. Most vehicle registration fees go to support schools. And here we are, um, called a fee, called a tax, whatever it is, raising taxes that in a system that is designed or has mostly been for schools and it's not going to, this fee tax is not gonna do that. Um, currently we pay $30 for a driver's license. Now it's gonna be 35. Um, so, you know, that's a, what would we call that? A 20% a increase or something like that. Um, I don't object to it. I think it's great. I think we should pay our own way and I'm happy to pay my own way. But I would like to see the taxes we raise through um, uh, vehicle registration fees go to schools. So I'll just say that. So thank you. Ms. Johnson, that, I appreciate your comments. I, I know when we first started talking about this in the hall and the chairman had this idea, we're both former appropriations members. And so you don't bring anything without finding a source of revenue for it. And so I think that's what, what the good chairman was up to. And, 
I totally get it though. Thank you for yeah. pointing that out. Anything for Ms. Johnson? Thanks, Tammy. Thanks. Appreciate it. Anybody else in the room like to testify on 254? Okay, let's let's go to anyone on our Zoom call tonight. Anyone on? Uh, please raise your hand if you'd like to testify on this bill. Going once, going twice. It doesn't look like we've got anyone, Danielle, who wants to testify on this bill. Uh, we had some roomies, but no zoomies. Um, okay, I'm gonna close public testimony on this bill. Uh, committee, what's your pleasure? Move it. Second. Okay, moved by Senator Anderson, second by Senator Pappas. Um, we have uh, committee a proposed amendment that I don't wanna forget. Um, the Landon proposed amendment is a, um, some corrections that, uh, that our staff has recommended to us. So let's uh, make sure that we maybe consider that one. And then also in your packet, you have a proposed amendment uh, 1502, um, which is the, the amendment that uh, Chairman Burkhart brought over, which would reflect that $5 increase in a driver's license. Uh, should we decide to put something in tonight? Okay. So with those two in mind, let's work the bill. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, this, uh, Senator Anderson. This, this Landon amendment has 2702. Is that supposed to be standing committee amendment number two? It's just, uh, what is it? I believe Senator Anderson, that is just a, a numbering system for proposed Amendment PROP means it's a proposed amendment uh, that is drafted up, and they can. I'm sure that's a system that they can go back and get that if we if they need to. And that other uh, one is 15. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, just, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I don't know that we need to go page by page, but let's do that. This is uh, it's a good bill. I want to take a good look at it. Uh, page one. Anything committee? Page two. Um, uh, let's go back to page one and, and let's go ahead, uh, committee, if anyone is so inclined to move the technical correction amendment, we could do that on page one. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator so Pat. all of this was developed by LSO? That is correct. Uh, why don't we just dispose of everything on this amendment in one fail shot? It looks like it's all- We're going to do that. That's all correct. Technical. Mm -hmm. And so- yep. I would move this amendment. Second. Okay. All right, moved. Uh, Pappas seconded by Anderson. Um, discussion. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor of that amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. That amendment has carried. Uh, Kim, do you have that proposed amendment? Okay, that has passed. Let's uh, continue on through the bill. Um, and then we we may or may not consider the second proposed amendment. Anything on page three committee that you can see that, um, fifty percent of any fee implemented. That's at the top of the page. Um, I'm going to ask a question on that, Chairman Burkhart. Just um, thank you. Sorry to call you back up. That, that uh, provision, uh, paragraph B, bottom of two, top of page three, 50% of any, any fee implemented, um, that's the small portion of this bill that could uh, generate some, some funding for the account, could it not? Mr. Chairman, it could. And if you looked at, at the octopus chart, um, the size of the circles represent roughly the size of access that those people exert and vendor access, which would be insurance companies and others is a fairly good size bubble on there that would generate some money. And paragraph section B allows the, the department to set those fees uh, and to set them at an amount that, that they will at worst break even at best put some money in the account. Thank you, uh, Senator Pappas. Mr. Chairman, uh, the department is, also, is already collecting the 
collecting fees, correct? Mr. Chairman, Senator, yes, they are. But the fees, I don't even think the fees pay for use of the system at the current time. Senator Pappas, so go ahead. My question, number one, where are they going now? And if this is implemented, uh, I'm assuming the 50% that doesn't go to the computer system will continue to go to wherever they go now? Mr. Um, Chairman, ahead, Senator, Chairman. yes. And they just go to their general operating account, to my recollection, um, wherever uh, they, they need them. But, but Mr. Chairman, this, this allows for 50% of those to be uh, funneled over into this account that we create with this bill, correct? Correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, okay just want to make, Senator McEwen. Just want to point out, it says Green. 50. Thank you, sir. Since we're going out over the airwaves. Mr. Chairman, I just want to point out, it says at least 50%, and I'm not sure what that means. Chairman Burkhart, thoughts on that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That would mean a minimum of 50%, that at least 50% of it go to that. They could put more if they decide, the department decides that they want to put 100% to it for one reason or another. They have the ability to do that. The 50%, okay. the at least means that's a minimum. Okay, Chairman, thanks for clarifying that. Follow up then, Senator McEwen. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Just if they have the ability to take zero to 100%, why would we even put at least 50 in there? Um, Senator McEwen, uh, take a look at that. And if you have a language idea, we could sure entertain that. Senator Pappas, it sounds like you do. Maybe. Well, I, I, the reason why it's in there is that to ensure that at least 50% goes to that. I mean, if we didn't put it in there, then the department could take it off for some other reason. And that's not our intent for raising these fees. Uh, our, our intent is for, okay. to fund the system. Senator um, McEwen? I'm pretty sure I just heard we could go all the way up to 100%. So, Senator Pappas. Mr. Chairman, yes, and that's okay. But what if, if we didn't put anything in here, if we didn't put the minimum, the department wouldn't have to put, theoretically, wouldn't have to put any of these fees towards the system. Okay, Senators, I'm going to go back to Chairman Burkhart and see if there was any discussion about that 50% figure They're on the true. House side. Mr. Chairman, no, there was not, other than to set it at a at least 50%, meaning they have to put 50% of that money at least in there. They can always put more in, but they can't go below 50%. The idea being... Chairman Burkhart, that, that we want to get this fund started. We, we, we've got to get this computer fund uh, established and, and start putting some money in the account. Correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Senator Pat. Well, I, I just think that the, I mean, we're raising fees, right? And and for one, for, for, an, for an intended purpose, and that's to purchase this new system. And so, if you don't at least put a minimum of these fees, we could be raising fees and not going to the system at all. So okay. I mean, thanks, fr thanks, frankly, thanks. frankly, I'm not so sure that it shouldn't be 100%. Thanks but. for that clarification, Senator. And I, I do appreciate the question from Senator McEwen too. That's, uh, we can always revisit that. Go ahead, so Mr. Mr. Chairman. Burkhart. These fees are on third party use of the system. They are not on DCI or the Wyoming residents who use them, they are, these fees are for third parties who are then selling the data at a profit to themselves. And the point. state is being shortchanged uh, on that to me. Very good point. Thanks for staying with us as, as we work this, uh, Chairman Burkhardt, if you don't mind. Uh, well, committee, uh, again, let's, let's keep that in the back of our minds. This has got a ways to go, even if it goes upstairs, okay? Um, we can certainly take a look at that. Anything else on page three? Uh, comments, questions, or amendments? Page four. Page five. Um, page five. Uh, we get started. Um, on paragraph D uh, committee, I wanted to have a conversation with all of you in this regard. I, 
it sounds like this came from the from the House Appropriations Committee. This idea of of a of a committee. Um, I guess I'm wondering if how do how do you senators feel about a committee doing this? I just wondered if we really needed another committee of all of these folks. Um, I guess if if they're willing to come together, we're not funding this committee at all. There's no funding. Um, am I the only one that looked at that for longer than I should have? No, you're right, Mr. Chairman. Twelve members, and they're gonna they're gonna look at this and come to an agreement. I don't I don't think I don't think that's right. Mr. Chairman, Sen Senator Pappas. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with it. We're not we're not funding a tra task force here. It's it's uh, similar to what we did during the last uh, interim. Uh, I worked on a committee with the department. Uh, everybody put their own time in. It it wasn't a funded it wasn't a funded thing. So, uh, but frankly, to have input from all these people, I think is important. Uh, if not, then uh, I'm sure the director is going to go out and do it anyhow. I, he's going to need input from, from folks. So I, I don't have a problem here. We're not creating a task force. We're not funding anybody. Everybody here is going to come of their own volition. Okay. You convinced me, Senator. Let's move on. How about page seven? Anything, committee? Um, anything on page eight? Mr. Mr. Chairman, Go is ahead. that pretty quick that uh, July 1st, 2021, they're going to give us a report? Um, sounds pretty. That you sounds know, pretty, um, pretty quick. Senator Anderson, that's a great catch. I, uh, Chairman Burkhart, thoughts on that? Mr. Chairman, that date was selected uh, as a start to the project and as uh, a date that the department starts giving us reports. The main reason being they've already done a lot of legwork uh, to this. They, they should already have quite a bit of information. I know they've talked to at least two major suppliers of computer systems. Uh, again, I'm going by memory on that one, and I could be as much off as I was on the amount of money generated. So uh, I guess figure that as, as maybe a one-fourth answer. Um, but that's the reason. They, they've already started working on this. Um, the main thing with this bill is to give that final push to say, get this done. Yeah. It's vitally important. As the, the representative from the Clerks Association said, they, they put things into this. If they lose this system, the only way they have left to do it is, is by mail. Yeah. So, um, so, so that's the reason. And I felt if it was important enough, it should be a fairly quick timeline. Uh, originally, the uh, 2027 date uh, for conclusion, uh, I was actually sooner than that. Appropriations amended that and said, no, you're being too aggressive. Uh, I wanted 2026, give them five years. Uh, appropriations said, no, give them an extra year. So Chairman, I think, I think we meet in August. Um, we could probably do that, um, but it, if you think three months is good enough, uh, Senator Pappas, you've got something. Well, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I mean, if you look at what's in that paragraph, it's not a report. Line 10 and 11, a proposed timeline. That's all they're going to be working on. They're going to give us a timeline, all right? We're not, they're not going to give us a fully developed report, so this is just a timeline by then. And I think that is certainly doable, especially since they've been working on it. Uh, paragraph G is actually when they're giving us a report. So uh -oh. actually give us the joint cooperation. Yeah. Mi so Mr. Chairman, if I may. Go ahead, Chairman Burkhart. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you look at line 19, it starts there. Um, joint transportation, joint appropriations at their next meeting after. Gotcha. July 1st okay. of 2021. I think Thank that clarifies everything. And so in our August meeting uh, committee, we can expect something back on that. I got one okay. question. Senator McEwen. Mr. Chairman, uh, 
Did we mention that we're going to hire a consulting firm probably as we go through this? And the reason I ask that question, if we're going to pay money to a consulting firm, I want to go back to the 12 member board. Is that really necessary if we're going to go pay somebody to tell us what to do? I don't see how the 12 member board is going to help more than the consultant. So uh, Chairman Burkhart, and we could probably ask the director of IDOT that too. Mr. Chairman, we've already hired a consultant. They've already given us a report. I believe that the department has hired, used a different consultant also to get this information. Um, so we already have most of that information, I believe. Okay, okay thank you, Chairman Burkhart. Follow-up, Senator McEwen. I, I almost think we, I'm with you. I don't think we need to form another committee. I, I don't know what we add. And I guess I'm thinking about it like this. I own a grocery store and, and I bring co-op members in to help me with some of the things I don't know. And I don't form another committee to second guess them. Let's, uh, Senator, that's a good thought. Uh, like I said, I think this bill has a ways. Let's give some, let's give some thought as we go forward. It's probably if we, uh, if we bring that other amendment in, for example, it'll go to appropriations as well, and we can we can vet this as we go. Um, I, I'm going to move on so we can get on through this bill and on to the next one, uh, committee. So that takes us kind of to the end of the bill here. Um, anything else on pages eight or nine? And um, committee, what what are the thoughts? Um, regarding whether or not we want to put this uh, $5 fee in that would be represented by proposed amendment 1502. Um, that, um, I guess I'm kind of feeling like I'm, I'm not sure we have anything to lose by putting something there. Senator Pappas. I, I agree. Uh, and so I would move it. Moved by Senator Pappas uh, to, to put that $5 fee on licenses, driver's licenses, renewals. Uh, I would second something, but I'm not sure what I'm seconding. Are you just doing G, the, the $5 fee, or are you doing the whole, the whole thing? I believe, uh, and Chairman Burkhardt, I'm going to confirm this with you. The proposed amendment that you helped uh, me with today, thank you for that. This, uh, this represents only the $5 driver's license fee. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Right. Okay. And so Let's Senator see. Anderson did, did second the, uh, the motion. So now we can have discussion. Senator Anderson. So there's a lot of other things here. Motorcycle safety education, disposition of the fees. Uh, I, like the, I like the G paragraph, but I, I don't know enough about the rest of it to know. So, Mr. Chairman, if Chairman I might. Chairman Burkhart, if you could expound on that a little bit. Mr. Chairman, these were in the original bill. The reason they are there is conforming. Okay. Um, if you look at 315-1506, um, again, it talks about fees, so you have to put that in that it's less the amount distributed uh, under that other section, gotcha. G. If you look at 317104, again, you refer to the other sections in the allocation under uh, 113G. They have to be there to make it conform uh, to this. And plus then page one, line two, that goes into the uh, title of the bill. Um, and again, it's conforming to cover all of these issues. Thank you, Chairman Burkhart. Uh, Senator Pappas. So uh, just, just just to kind of reiterate, please look, when you're looking at this, the underlying text is what's new text. The, the additional language actually uh, is, is there already. And we're just modifying that language that's there. Yeah. So when you read things like the wildlife conversation account, all that's in law now, we're not adding that. We're only adding, uh, we're amending that paragraph to just add that 
Yeah, section I, I, G, which I, I is think on the chairman. I, yeah. I think Chairman okay. Anderson did that. I, I just think he was trying to make sure that we weren't drawing fees out of some place that we shouldn't be. So, uh, but I think um, so. Committee further uh, further discussion on the amendment, the proposed mm -hmm. amendment to add the fee. Ready for the question? Yep. All those in favor of. Senator Pappas's motion to accept the proposed amendment. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. Okay, I think that passes on a four to one vote. Uh, the proposed amendment. Do you have that, Kim? Okay, we'll suggest that, and it'll go to appropriations, and probably be out by the time it comes down to the floor. So, I'm kidding. Sometimes they leave them in there. You never know. Uh, we're back to the bill. Uh, anything further, committee? Okay, so Kim, would you please take the roll on uh, House Bill 254? We'll call vote House Bill 254 engrossed. Senator Anderson? Aye. Senator Furphy? Aye. Senator McEwen? Aye. Senator Pappas? Aye. Chairman Landon? Aye. Five ayes do pass amended. Chairman Burkhart, uh, nice work on that bill. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll uh, We'll take it out to the floor. Do you have somebody to manage it or? Mr. Chairman, I'm at the mercy of the committee on, on someone to floor manage it. Okay. Or the goodwill, either Maybe way. I'll try to play point guard, not dribble it off my knee, and hopefully I can pass the ball to one of these guys by getting thank down you, Mr. court. Chairman. How's that? Members okay. of the committee, thank you. Representative Burkhart, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Okay, committee, the next uh, bill for our consideration uh, tonight is uh, House Bill 249. Uh, railroad safety and uh, welcome representative Clifford. Hi. Nice to see a former corporations and elections uh, committee mate. Nice to see you. Thank you chairman, members of the committee. I bring to you house bill 249. Um, and you may be asking yourself why I'm bringing this bill, but I just need to remind the committee that I have a railroad that goes through the pristine Wind River Canyon. There have been some derailments there. So this is of, of, of great concern. Um, this bill is about safety. Um, and like you, I believe Wyoming's um, greatest resource is her people. And because we care about Wyoming and her people who live and work um, here, the safety of many um, Wyoming Knights who work in the cab of a locomotive is very important. But equally important is the safety of our communities and our state. There are several Wyoming communities who currently rely on railroads for business and nationally reports show how too many workers remain at serious risk of workplace injury, illness, and death. A total of 5,333 workers died from work-related injury in the US in 2019, up 2% 2 from 2018, where a total of 5,250 workers were killed on the job. Similar legislation like this has passed in nine states premised on health and safety. So to walk you through the bill, this bill is gonna create a new section 37-9-506, Railroad Train Crews Civil Penalties. So starting on page one, on line 12 through to line 15 and continuing on to page two, lines one through two, subsection A, says that no train used in a class one or class two railroad shall operate in the state without at least two people. This is crucial because jobs until working with hazardous materials every day. They may transport spent nuclear fuel one day, our radioactive materials another, our rockets and bombs on military trains another day. And the data shows that 50,000 deaths a year across the US are attributed to occupational diseases caused by chemical exposures. On page two, starting on line three, subsection B, this bill is going to create an action of venue in the circuit court for the county in which the agreed party resides or where the railroad company, corporation, or employer alleged this to have violated the section to recover a civil penalty for a willful violation which may be brought by an agreed party, county, district, or the attorney general. And no action shall be entitled to a trial by jury. If an action is to be determined determined to be a violation, the circuit court shall impose penalties. So on line 19 of page two, Romanet I, a first violation penalty, um, you'll see it there. It's ranging from not less 
$250 and not more than 1,000. And then continuing on to page three, lines eight through one through eight, a second violation penalty committed within three years could range from not less than 1,000 and not more than 5,000. And again, that keeps the time period open for three years before it resets back to a first offense. And then you'll see the third violation there, um, not less than 5,000 and not more than 10,000. On line 10, this section shall not apply to an employer who allows any person to move locomotives unattached to rail cars within a rail yard or operate a helper service, which temporarily assists a train that requires more power. If this bill should pass, the effective date will be July 1, 2020, 21. And that's the bill. Thank you, Representative Clifford. Nicely done, committee. Uh, Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not familiar with the railroad uh, nomenclature here. What is class one or class two railroad? Representative? So the class one is um, anything that um, operated carrying rail trade 444, 447 million or more. And then class two is less than 447, but more than 35.8 um, million. So that's the... Is, is the class that, one, class two. Representative, is that pounds? Um, that's dollars. I guess oh, the dollars. dollars amount of the freight is, is what I believe. But there's people to testify okay. better to this. That, but yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. Uh, follow up, Senator. I, I, I don't understand that, but okay. <laughs> Committee, question? Go ahead, Senator McEwen. Mr. Chairman, we referenced the derailment. I'd like to know how many people were on the train when it derailed. Uh, and did the derailment happen due to the number of people on the train or was it another problem? And, and my last question was, we're gonna send this to circuit court and not allow somebody to request a jury and they can be found guilty without a jury. I think that's what I heard. So those are my questions, Mr. Chairman. So, Representative, what can you tell us about those derailments that you alluded to? Uh, the one particular, the yeah, Mr. Um, Chairman and, and Senator McEwen, um, the one I'm repre represent, or referencing is the one that happened in the Winterberg Canyon. And it was just a, a boulder that fell on the rail. And if it wasn't for two people, two eyes, you know, uh, looking ahead, um, it derailed into the into the waters there. And if it was just one person operating that train, um, the, the second um, person on the train um, needed help getting help and they possibly could have drowned. Um, and this was a compromise. You'll see the engrossed, um, you'll see the engrossed copy. And this was brought by um, an amendment uh, that did deal with uh, the district court and those penalties, changing them from taking out the misdemeanors and the fines and changing it um, to what you have here in this bill, um, which is gonna just be the violations. Um, and I, I don't know if I answered all, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if I'm missing a question or not. So Representative, uh, Senator McEwen had a, a question with regard to um, the, the civil action paragraph. <laughs> and I kind of, had one as well, but can you repeat your question, Senator McEwen, for the representative? I think I heard we're going to dispose of the case without a jury. And, and I think we're robbing people of their rights to a jury trial if they want to argue it that way. We're, we're making a decision that we're administratively going to ha handle it without a jury, Mr. Chairman. So... Representative Clipper, thank you, Senator. And just, just to kind of add to this, to, to maybe help us get our arms around uh, this civil penalty paragraph. So an action to recover this civil penalty would be brought by whom against whom, and then whoever the respondent is, is not going to have that opportunity for the jury trial, it says down lower in the paragraph. Does, does that make sense? Can you help us with who, who brings the civil action to whom and why no jury? Um, you know, again, this was a compromise um, brought um, as an amendment. Um, 
And I think there's people that are going to testify that could answer that question. So I apologize, but there's people um, here willing to testify that could um, answer those questions. So sorry, I can't answer that. That's okay, Representative. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. We're just we're just working hard to get arms around it and um, appreciate it. Committee, any other questions of Representative Clifford before we let her sit back? And we'll uh, Senator Pappas. Yeah, just an, another thought on that civil penalty. I, it wasn't in the original bill, and it was added by a second reading amendment in in uh, uh, in the House uh, that was adopted and then further tweaked in the third reading amendment. Uh, can you can you give me a flavor of the discussion on the, on the floor of why they went to such a why did they why did they add the civil penalties and I mean it was a quite a big change to the bill. So Representative Clifford, what was Representative Greer up to? Yeah. <laughs> I, that is a good question, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not sure what he was up to, but um, um, I just thought it was a friendly amendment, and that's what I got up and, and just uh, testified on the floor about. I'm sorry, Senator Pappas, that, that doesn't ask to your question, but. Um, Thank you, Representative yeah. Clifford. I, sure. I know we have others in the room yep. who can maybe help us with this too, and sure. um, so if you don't mind sticking around, if you can, sure. Sure, in case right we can. have another question. Uh, and committee, I'm going to go to uh, public comment on the bill. Let's start with uh, those in the room first. Absolutely, Ms. Johnson. You were you were going to be first. Yeah. Please uh, come forward, state your name. And good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Tammy Johnson with Wyoming State AFL-CIO, um, and we support this bill. And um, I just have a couple of points. Um, one, uh, Senator McEwen, um, civil trials typically are bench trials. They typically don't have a jury. Um, so that's pretty common um, in these kinds of uh, violations. So that's, that's normal. Um, the, the, either party can ask for a, a jur trial by jury, but, um, and then that can be granted. I suppose this language would preclude that, but I don't, I think that there's provisions. So anyway, so that's probably why that language is there. I didn't put it in. Um, I, I just like you to contemplate as you think about this bill about the people of Wyoming, and this is good for the people of Wyoming in many, many ways. Um, one, it's about 800 jobs that pay roughly $100,000 a year. So you do the math, $80 million in, in salaries for the people of Wyoming. Think about how that money circulates in your communities. I can't see anyone sitting here who doesn't have a rail yard or trains going through their communities. So um, think about that. Um, we hear a lot of testimony on all kinds of, uh, particularly tax exemption requests that say, oh, the jobs, oh, the jobs. This is a bill that's about jobs. This is truly about the jobs of the people in your communities. Um, the other thing, uh, thinking about the good for the people of Wyoming is the safety aspect, not just the people on the train. Um, we don't know how many accidents are avoided because there were two people on the train. We know how many happen, but we don't know how many are avoided. Um, we don't have the data on that. And um, uh, so I think it's important to think about that. Um, railroad crossing blockings for hours and hours and hours, rural communities that can't get in and out, ranchers that can't get off their property because the train has, has is stopped and there's one guy, or if there were one person on the train, um, that person can't go back and fix the train. They've got to wait for help. So um, those kinds of scenarios are what we would be facing. Um, and we even face those now um, when the trains are stopped for, for quite a while. Um, my access to the dog park is often blocked because of the train that sits across the tracks for quite some time. Um, but I just want you to think, as you think about this, um, let's think about the people of Wyoming and what's good for them. Jobs, yes. Safety, yes. Communities safer, yes. Um, the people on the train safer. Um, I would just like you to think about that and think about the people that you represent who sent you here to represent them and their concerns and their needs. Um, so as uh, I'll have to answer any questions. Questions for Ms. Johnson from the ACLU. AFL-CIO, sir. AFL-CIO, sorry. sorry. A little bit different. I screwed that up. Sorry about that. <laughs> and by the way, that, that says right here, AFL-CIO. Thank you. I wrote it down. 
That basketball reference, I'm not sure. I think the owner of the Senate basketball team should have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as you, as you know, I can dribble it off the knee pretty easily. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. appreciate it. We have others in the room who can answer some questions I have. Mr. Winnie, come on forward. Mr. Chairman, Bill Winnie, Sublette County. I'd like to approach this from a completely different perspective than you're probably going to hear the rest of the evening. I followed uh, this legislation last session and this session. <clears throat> We're talking about the law of gross tonnage and proper operation of a complex machinery plant. Uh, I've commanded two ships in the Navy, 8,700 ton nuclear powered submarine and an 18,000 ton rated diesel electric plant. That uh, nuclear submarine plant is like closest thing you'll ever see in this world to instantaneous power at your fingertips. I had to go back emergency in the channel one time, that thing stopped dead in the water. On the other hand, that diesel electric plant, you had to plan ahead. That thing had six big uh, diesel generators for propulsion, and uh, you put the number online that you need. You can kind of imagine one of the lo one of the trains down here is being three locomotives in the front, couple in the middle, one on the back. Like I said, you had to plan ahead. So what do you got to do in the cab of that locomotive? I think there's two mutually exclusive tasks that you need to consider. Number one, somebody's got to be looking out the window. Imagine you're in your car. And when you decide to put the brake on, it takes three blocks to stop. That's what we're looking about with the law of gross tonnage. It takes a long time for that kind of tonnage to come to a stop. You gotta be looking way down the road. You got lots of different things. Whether you've heard about a boulder on the tracks or animals or vehicles that are crossing, take your pick. Somebody's gotta be looking and they gotta be looking all the time. That's a standard you use on a ship at sea. You have to have a lookout. If you don't have a lookout, you're responsible for what happens. The second thing is operating those diesel engines. I mean, in this modern world of computers and everything, that's a full-time job for those guys. And they're frequently operating uh, three, four, maybe five, maybe even six different locomotives for one control station in the uh, cab, multi-unit as they call it. That's a full-time task. So in my view, you have two tasks that have to go on at the same time. They're mutually exclusive and you need two people to do them. Like I said, subject to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Winnie. Questions for Mr. Winnie? Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Who else would like to testify on uh, 249? Please come forward. Come on forward. Thank you. You could state your name for us, and for the record, we'd really appreciate that. Appreciate you being here. Mr. Chairman, Senators, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been sitting too long. My name is Dick Merklin. I think some of you or all of you may have received an email from me this past uh, weekend regarding this issue. First of all, I'll let you know I'm. Cheyenne, Wyoming native. I was born and raised here, graduated from East High School, first class from that school. I uh, left home after that, went into the United States Navy and uh, spent the next 50 years, various jobs, but I wound up with Union Pacific Railroad in North Platte, Nebraska. <clears throat> I'm a retired locomotive engineer, 28 of my 30 years, with Union Pacific Railroad, I was in the cabs of locomotives pulling the throttle. HB 249 that we're discussing this evening, rail safety is needed in today's work environment in the locomotive cab to ensure the safety of the conductor and the engineer, their train and the citizens who reside along the tracks in the communities where the trains operate 
24-7-365. Duties of a locomotive engineer have increased dramatically over the last 15 years. The engineer is not only looking at the track ahead of the train, but he's also monitoring all of his computers, the gauges, the airflow, the PTC, which is positive train control that the companies think is the best safety thing in the world. It's not. EOTs, in the train device, DPUs, that's called distributed power units. Those are the units that are located throughout the train. They usually block them at about 8,000 to 10,000 feet back from the lead locomotive. And then in some cases, they will have a locomotive on the tail end of the train, rear end of the train, all controlled from the lead locomotive. <clears throat> As such, the engineer needs a second pair of eyes that the conductor provides. It is the conductor who communicates with the dispatcher and the conductor copies the different forms that are necessary for safe train movement. But before that can happen, the engineer has to scroll through his computer monitors and find the appropriate form that the dispatchers tell him it has to be filled out for the forward movement of that train. When the engineer is doing this, the, induct the conductor is the one who is looking ahead of the train for any impediments that might be there that would hamper the safe movement of that train. The conductor is the one who looks the train over when going around curves, get up and come out, come over behind the engineer. And if it's a left-hand curve, they look out the back of their window on the cab if it's a left-hand curve. <clears throat> the engineer and the conductor also look for shifted loads on opposing trains, such as uh, shifted lumber loads. I know none of you sitting here this evening have ever had a two before come through your window of your car, but it's a very frightening thing. <clears throat> Both crew members must be on the lookout for close clearances and meets, such as what uh, Representative uh, Clifford talked about, the big boulder in the track. Plus, well, on the lighter side, they even have to be more vigilant when either one of them have to use the restroom. And when you're only doing about eight to 12 miles an hour out there on the main line with these long mega trains, that's about all that you make. Very time consuming. HB 249 is a safety bill for rail, train and engine crews, and the populace that live along the tracks. Nothing more. Two pair of eyes are a lot better than one. Thank you for your consideration and an I vote for its passage. It'll be appreciated by all of those concerned with the safe operations of the trains. Just as a side note, uh, Representative Clifford said that there are several states that have adopted and have statutes on the books for two person crews. I think it's about nine. There's another 11 that, are have, that have legislation pending. And hopefully Wyoming will be added to that list. Just for a, a last reference, the mega trains that the Union Pacific Railroad is running now are around 18,000 feet. That's 3.4 miles long. There's talk, and I want to emphasize the word talk, of trying to run them four and five miles long. We're going to have crossings blocked, or those that are still working. I've been retired since 2007. We're going to have crossings blocked forever. And I want you to put yourself into the cab of that locomotive, or you have a, a family member that lives at a small town that the railroad goes right through the middle of, and that train has that crossing block, the one and only crossing block, for hours. And you need an EMT now. We're going to have people 
die. This is a safety bill, has nothing to do with anything else. It's rail safety. Two men on a crew are the best thing that we can have in this day and age. The only thing changes on the railroad is the day on the calendar and their bottom line. Any questions? Mr. Merklin, thank you. Appreciate you being here and, and uh, go T-Birds, by golly. Thank you. Um, any questions for Mr. Merklin? Okay. Oh, one down here. Senator Furphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it's good to see a fellow native Wyomingite. <laughs> There's a few of us left. Mr. Merkel, let me ask you about how often was your employer requiring you to operate a train with less than two people? Thank you. Mr. Merklin. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, Senator Furphy. I never operated a train with less than a conductor and I was operating trains when they still had a brakeman. So we had uh, anywhere from uh, four to five people on a crew. They started eliminating the crew members with the 85 crew consist agreement that eliminated cabooses, first of all, and put a $5,000 EOT on the end of the train and, and uh, took one brakeman with them. Then through attrition, they, they got rid of the jobs and the one brakeman that was left, if he had conductor seniority, he could exercise that seniority and it, it bumped on down. But they got rid of the brakeman. They went to a two-man crew, the conductor and the engineer. That's how I operated most of the trains. How often you ask, they would have us run out. I ran in the coal pool when it first opened up the Powder River coal that you're all familiar with. Uh, we were lucky to make it over the road because we had so many trains, but we could work 12 hours and for the run from North Platte to South Morrill, we'd make it about halfway before we ran out of time on our 12 hours of service, about 65, 70 miles. And they'd have to haul us the rest of the way up. So if we got rested, we'd catch another train coming back home. We usually got home, we would get our rest, which would be if we worked over 12 hours, the federal requirement is 10 hours rest. It's 10 hours rest. You knew that phone was going to ring at eight and a half hours. We did that for years. And it took both of us to keep each other alert and attentive to get that train safely over the road. No less than one on a train. It's got to be two, no less than two. Senator Furphy, follow up? You good? Senator Anderson. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, you referred to something in 84, some, some uh, agreement or something. Was that a union agreement? It was a, it was a union, it was the national agreement. Mm -hmm. It was called, it was 1985, it was called the Halloween agreement because it went into effect October 31st, 1985. And that's what started the reduction of crew members on the trainman side. But that was a union agreement. They agreed to that with the- The railroads agreed, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Yes, and we did too, and it's still in force today. Okay. But that's not I, the issue I, here. I this issue is safety. Okay. Thank right. you, Mr. Merklin. Anything else for Mr. Merklin? Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. And thanks thank for your patience. You. Thank as you. As we worked those other bills and we finally got to this one. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to anyone else who would like to testify on this bill in the meeting room tonight. And we do have Ms. Leininger, I believe, has a hand up on Zoom. We'll get to her a little bit later. Please come forward. Thank you. Please state your name for the record for us. Appreciate sure, Jeremy. Being here. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it. My name is J.P. Caffey. I'm from Gillette. Actually, Senator McCune represents my district, Senate District 24. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, HB 249, it's about safety. 
This is not, uh, unions were brought up. This is not about collective bargaining. This bill is all about safety. It's about keeping a trained and qualified locomotive engineer and a trained and qualified train conductor on our trains. There are people here that'll probably tell you differently, but this is about keeping Wyoming communities, our people, our property, our land, and our water safe. After returning home from Iraq 15 years ago, I uh, began working for BNSF Railway. I've been on a lot of coal trains and also a lot of freight trains, many with hazardous materials. I help move them. I help service our customers at various industries in and around Gillette, Sheridan, Guernsey, Wyoming, and I've also worked in Newcastle. We work on call. The railroad calls us and says it's time to go to work around the clock, 24 hours a day. We are subject to that phone call. When that phone rings, we have 90 minutes to be at the depot and ready for work. 6 a.m., 6 p.m., 11 p.m., 3 a.m., we never know. There is no schedule. Healthy sleep patterns are non-existent. I personally, I personally looked over and found my engineer sleeping on or dozing off on numerous occasions. It used to alarm me. It doesn't anymore. <clears throat> Technology is improving and we as employees embrace it, but it still does not replace the human element. We're not there yet. And uh, with that, I just, you know, my grandfather comes to mind and, and he was a cattle rancher and he used to say, just because trouble comes knocking doesn't mean you have to give it a place to sit down. And uh, I urge you to support HB 249. It's good for Wyoming. Thank you. Mr. Caffey, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, questions? Senator McEwen. Totally unrelated, Mr. Chairman. Where were you at in Iraq? All over. Who'd you serve with? Second 147th Field Artillery Army. I was there about 15 months, and we did mostly convoy security, so we worked all around the country. Mr. So you're Caffey. Red Lake. Yes, sir. Mr. Caffey, love thanks, that. thanks for your service. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate that very much, and thank you, Senator McEwen, for bringing that up. Uh, thanks much for being here tonight. Appreciate yeah. you guys. Okay, we're going to move on to more uh, testimony. Anyone else who would like to testify on House Bill 249? Please come forward. State your name for us and appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Cindy Delancey, and it's really a, a pleasure to come into transportation this evening. I don't get to see you very often in this committee. So uh, House Bill 249 brings me here tonight. I feel really compelled to, to speak in opposition against this bill uh, um, as the president of the Wyoming Business Alliance. Our members do not support this. We, uh, again, have seen this bill many years. Comes the legislature, you vote it down each time and it keeps coming back, kind of like a boomerang. And really what this bill is about, contrary to the testimony that you've heard, this is a labor bill. This, this is a bill about agreements. This is a bill about, as uh, Senator Anderson identified, agreement that's currently in effect. There can be no changes to crew size by the employer, the railroad, without the consent of the employees. That's well-established principles of federal law. That's why they have a union. States that are passing this, as, as uh, Mr. Merkel uh, raised, is California and Colorado. Wyoming doesn't pass legislation that ties the hands of business like California and Colorado does. After the year that we've been through with the pandemic, we're at a time now that business needs government and our elected officials to help do everything they can to get out of the way so we can try to come out and recover and keep people employed. Uh, the former testimony about jobs, safety, and community, those are cornerstones to any business. Many of you are businessmen. Your most valuable asset are your people. 
You won't take risks to put their lives in jeopardy. You want your people to go home at night. You won't make policy decisions or operational decisions regardless of, of profit margins that would endanger uh, your most valued employees or, or your most valued asset, which is your employees. As I said, you know, that this is a well-established area of federal law, that there's really no place for the state of Wyoming to inject itself in a two-party contract. This is a, nego a labor negotiation between employers and an employee, not the state of Wyoming. If, if this committee allows this bill to move forward and sets this precedent, where will it end? Is the state of Wyoming going to be dictating how we operate our ranching operations, how we, you know, is, a, is, is two chefs in the kitchen going to be required because there's dangerous gas? You know, we, we as business leaders want the very best for our people, and we, we don't want uh, additional regulation uh, driving costs up. And why I bring up costs, because ultimately, if this bill moves forward, that's the end result. The coal companies are the biggest uh, customers of many of our rail lines in Wyoming. And when um, such a, such, if something so significant like this were to move forward, ultimately the cost would be passed on to the customer, which is in many times mines. The mines are not in any position to absorb additional costs right now. So for those reasons, you know, of course, safety goes without saying. It is of paramount importance. No changes can be made about the crew size unless there is mutual agreement. We can't fix in this bill odd schedules, you know, between the, the again, the negotiation between employers and employees. Um, we just sincerely ask that uh, you vote uh, no uh, and keep these business principles uh, alive and well in Wyoming. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lancey. Any questions for the Wyoming Business Alliance? Questions? Thanks for being here. One question. Senator Anderson. Uh, Mr. Chairman. The last time I heard this bill, I think it was two years ago, uh, we talked about how long uh, the rules had been in place. And I don't remember that, but it was 20 some years, the rules had been in place. And the, the people that testified then uh, with the company said they had no intention of changing that. And as, I, as that developed, they didn't change that in their next negotiation. Now I can't say what the next negotiation is, but they didn't change that. Do you remember how long that had been in place uh, for two people on the railroad? Ms. Delancey. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't recall this, but I do recall the discussion about the Halloween agreement from 1985, which uh, I believe Mr. Merkel's testimony was that that's the current negotiation that is in place requiring oh. no less than, than uh, two people to be on, um, a train. So that's what I find interesting about this discussion is if that is what the current operating procedure is, there hasn't been any indication that there's, you know, a desire to go down to one member. I, I certainly don't want to speak for um, the railroads. I think there's plenty of people behind me that can answer that question with greater specificity. But as we enhance in all our businesses, the utilization of technology, that adds an additional layer of safety that probably wasn't in place when that uh, negotiation occurred in 85. So in fact, um, you know, things that riding a train today probably looks safer than it, is, it did at that time when that negotiation was struck. So um, with that, I'm happy to defer to the experts behind me as far as that can give you more of a specific answer. But again, the, the key point here is that nothing can change unless there's mutual consent amongst the parties. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Lancey. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to the to the next uh, speaker, please come forward. State your name for us. Appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Nathan Anderson and I uh, represent Union Pacific Railroad. I speak today in opposition to House Bill 249. We've heard significant testimony today, um, some of it very emotional. I want you to know that safety is good for business. Safety is our number one priority. In fact, let me, let me correct that. Safety is imperative for business. It is our number one priority. Everyone in this room is focused on safety. Now we've had testimony that this is about jobs and we've heard testimony that this is about safety and we've heard testimony about, um, about collective bargaining. 
Um, I want to make two points, if I could. First, safety improvements are made when proven practices, the procedures, techniques, and technologies are implemented. And then second, those changes to the work environment, to the work requirements, to the personnel deployment can be addressed because those changes to the technology and the practices have been implemented. Then through the collective bargaining agreement, we can say, hey, this change took place. It allows us to look at things differently, to do things differently. And as a result, let's talk about that in, in the bargaining agreement. Um, Mr. Chairman, with, with your permission, I'd like to bring in two colleagues. Dan Blank is Union Pacific's Chief Safety Officer. He deals with all aspects of rail safety and is deeply involved in the day-to-day -day safety practices at Union Pacific. And Brant Hanquist is the General Director of Labor Relations. He's intimately involved in the collective bargaining process. May I bring them to the table with me? Absolutely, Mr. Anderson. We'd love to hear from them. Uh, please come forward, gentlemen. And I would ask you the same as I have from everybody tonight. If you, when you get ready to speak, please uh, state your name and and who you represent uh, for the record. So thank you. All right, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Senators. Thank you for allowing us to come and talk with you. Uh, my name is Daniel Blank. As Nathan mentioned, I am the Chief Safety Officer for the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, also wanna thank the, the people that have already testified here in this room. First for the military service, um, and second for the perspective that they've given us as far as the team that operates our locomotives across the state of Wyoming. I've been with the railroad in safety and operations for 15 years, started back in 2006, um, shortly before uh, Mr. Merklin retired. And I want to talk to you today a little bit about safety and what that means to the Union Pacific. Now, Nathan already said safety is our number one priority. Union Pacific is committed to the safety of our employees, our customers, and the public. As a company, we continuously look for innovative approaches to enhance safety in every aspect of our business. And we invest significant resources in training, research and development, and public education, all with the goal of increasing rail safety awareness and improving safety in our community. For decades, the railroads and their labor partners have negotiated and maintained collective bargaining agreements regarding appropriate and safe crew size, which has been mentioned here already today. Since the 1980s, all key safety indicators have improved even as crew size has decreased. The Union Pacific, now 158 years old, can demonstrate that no correlation exists between crew size and safety, none. There is no objective data supporting two-person crews are safer than one-person crews. Historically, safety and technology improvements have been the primary catalyst for negotiations related to crew size. As a result of these improvements, rail labor and rail management have agreed to reductions in crew size from as many as five people in the 80s to two people on most territories today. A good example of that is the recent implementation of the positive train control. Technology on the Union Pacific that has helped enhance our infrastructure and further safety performance. As proud as we are, we will not be satisfied until we reach our target of zero incidents, injuries or fatalities involving employees, pedestrians and drivers. Quite frankly, it's in the industry's best interest to advance safety for our employees and the Federal Railroad Administration and our labor organizations will accept nothing less from us. Please consider allowing the forces that are already in the industry, organized labor, and multiple regulators to continue to demand ever improved safety results. Passing legislation that interferes with these well-established forces will have unintended consequences as we strive to remain a relevant mode of transportation. We heard a lot of mention of the technology that we do currently utilize, which has changed significantly even over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, we talked about a derailment because of a boulder that came down in front of the tracks that quite frankly, you wouldn't expect a train to be able to see and then stop for because of the tonnage of that rail train. But we do have things called slide detector fences where if you, you can have a fence up that can actually detect when rocks would move down onto the rail and influence the signal system immediately to tell the dispatching center and the train crew that there's a hazard ahead that they then need to adapt to. We have technology like wayside detectors that work um, immediately and tactically to identify wheels that are trending hot but also listen to wheels over time 
and gather data on the integrity of that equipment that we can then use to have proactive maintenance on some of our rail equipment. We have track geometry cards that go through and inspect our main line. We invest, um, in 2020, we invested $2.8 billion in our infrastructure. Money from our corporation to help strengthen the tie conditions, strengthen the rail conditions, the curve conditions, and strengthen our locomotive fleet and the technologies that we use. All geared towards safety for our crews, safety for our communities, and being able to continue to support the business that comes through states like Wyoming. I'll be happy to answer any questions that the committee here has for me tonight. Thank you, and, and Daniel, I didn't get the spelling of your last name, is it? B-L-A-N-K. Okay, thank you, I That's had it blank. right. So you had it right. Blank. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, you said you had some studies that uh, said that it was just as safe with one as two. How, how did you do those studies if we require two uh, all the time on the on the rails? Were those in a private uh, rail yard or something like that? Or how, how do you get statistics on one one person? That's, that's Mr. Bright, go ahead. Very good question, sir. Um, so there have been no studies that can prove that it is safer having two people than one person. Uh, we do have uh, railroads now, for instance, Amtrak. Uh, Amtrak operates with one locomotive engineer up in the cab. Um, we do have some other uh, class two railroads or short line railroads that may operate with one individual on that train crew. Oh, um, oh. And that's um, dependent again by the agreements that they have uh, with their labor organization. Okay, follow up Senator? No, that's, that's uh, good. Any other thank questions you. for Mr. Blank? Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, Let's go on to uh, please state your name yep. and uh, appreciate you being here. Yep. Thank you very much. Third member uh, of the UP team here. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Brant Hanquist. I'm the General Director of Labor Relations at Union Pacific. I'm here today to respectfully re express opposition to House Bill 249. Uh, as a 1985 graduate of Laramie High School, it's a privilege and an honor to be back in the great state of Wyoming and have the opportunity to present facts and my beliefs before this committee, something I thought I'd never be able to do. Uh, for decades, the railroad and their labor partners have negotiated and maintained collective bargaining agreements regarding appropriate and safe crew size. And safety has continued to improve, to improve across the industry. Um, you know, I've got this written, I, I've heard some questions, so I think I'm, I'm just gonna go off script and talk a little bit. Um, the question about how long these crew consist agreements have been in place. So we had the 1985 crew consist. That was a national negotiation through all the, through for the industry. We negotiate nationally for a lot of our work rules and wages, working conditions. Um, but it wasn't like on uh, Halloween of 1985 that we just took people out of the cab. It, it probably took us 10 years to get to where we want. It's a, it sets up a process where we could negotiate. And so most of those, at least at Union Pacific, and I can't speak for the whole industry, were probably in the early 90s. Um, I think, we, I don't study them, they're out there. Uh, I think there's maybe our last one was in, uh, I don't even want to say, but in the 90s. So they've been out there 25 years, give, it, give or take some. Um, so another question I heard was, are we currently talking? We have asked to be able to talk to the uh, smart transport rotation division about crew consist. Whether we will be able to or not is still not seen on the national table. Um, without boring you with all that yuck, um, even if we are, we're years away from removing people out of the cab. But we got to start having this conversation. We got to be more efficient. We got to get better. We got to compete with trucks. Um, this safety initiative seems to come at the beliefs that we like we're just going to rip every conductor out of the cab there's situations out here that probably will never that always require a second person in the cab it could be the terrain it could be the moffett tunnel in colorado it could be the caliani canyon in southern utah where there isn't a right-of-way road and, and if you get down in there by yourself you're stuck and it's going to stop our it'll tie up our complete system so there's weather conditions and maybe it's cargo. I don't know, we haven't had these conversations with the unions to be able to have an intelligent conversation of how this could work. 
another thing I've heard about being on call 24 seven, 90 minutes to report. That is, it's true. How the industry is starting to approach this is we call it crew redeployment. Not every train needs a second crew. So possibly that person comes out and is in a vehicle and I'll just throw, I don't, I'm, this could be a scenario. Train's going to go deliver to a customer. Conductor comes on duty. We're, we're seeing it at like at locations where there's enough traffic, North Platte, possibly Cheyenne, where my job is so many days a week. I start at the same time every day. I go home to my own bed every night. I come on duty, meet the engineer, help, help him get his train. He takes off heading for the customer. I can go over and assist another train, go do some other work. If he gets in trouble, I can drive out, meet him at the crossing where he needs cut. I can help that ambulance get through a lot quicker than that conductor can walk an 18,000 foot train is I think the length I keep hearing. It's not a bad thing. There's good things that can happen out of this, but you, we got to be able to negotiate and to talk to, to the unions about this. Um, the quality of life, you know, being able to, to know when you're coming back to work, our attendance is, is the biggest issue we have with our employees. We, because they don't know when they're going on duty. They need time off. How do you schedule? How do you know you're going to go to your kid's game? These are actually really good, could be really good jobs if it's set up correctly. So I think we got to look past this safety thing. And there are great situations where we can go with one person in the cab with support on the ground in a vehicle. Um, I'm not the technology guy. Um, I do believe the technology does allow for that. In, in, in the right situations. But a bill like this stifles those discussions and really kills um, a progressive workforce. You know, I, I was talking to Nathan today and it's like, what if we would have passed a law in 1880 that said you can't have elevators? I mean, you'd look back on it now and laugh and that's how this is going to be. But this is going to take us a decade to get to where we know where we're going. We don't know where we're going but we know there's possibilities to be more efficient and better and still provide a safe work environment and a better quality of life for employees. With that, I'll take questions. Mr. Hedquist, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Senators, any questions? We've got a labor relations expert with us. Any questions? Thank you for being thank here. You. And uh, Mr. Anderson, back to you for any final comments before Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to bring my colleagues today and uh, and share their subject matter expertise. Um, I think I would just say that uh, as they have as they have ably said, there is a suite of technologies. There is a there are a suite of practices. There are multiple um, agreements in place that allow us to see amazing safety uh, improvements. If you look at industrial safety, railroads are among the safest industrial uh, employers, we're even safer on a, on a per person basis than grocery stores. And we're proud of that. And we know that it's with our union professionals uh, that, that we working together, that we make those strides. And all we're asking you today, we're not asking you to judge whether one person or two people is the right number in a crew. We're saying, let the subject matter experts decide under the collective bargaining agreement. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, thank you. And I know you didn't mean anything personally to to our senator who, who owns and operates those grocery stores out there. <laughs> Thanks for being Can I get here. a mulligan, Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, rebuttal, Senator. There you go. I, I would point out that in 14 years in two grocery stores, the worst thing we've had happen was stitches on one occasion and a little bit of dehydration. Two cases, 14 years. I'm not sure the railroad's safer than the grocery business, but By I could be wrong. That's a that's a feather in the bonnet for Campbell County. I'll tell you outstanding, that. Outstanding, outstanding. Thanks, season. Senator. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. I I appreciate you guys being here tonight. Who else would uh, would like to testify on on House Bill two forty nine here in the room tonight? And we will just so everyone knows, we will get to uh, Mr. Runyon. Um, I believe that perhaps Miss Leininger, she's got a hand up. Uh, we have a couple on Zoom tonight, but I want to get folks in the in the room first. So please come forward. Let's keep clipping through tonight and 
we'll eventually get you all in. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Matt Jones. I'm with BNSF Railway. And uh, in respect of all your time tonight, I, I'm going to keep my comments very short because I, I can say that I do concur with all of the comments from my, my colleagues of Union Pacific and, um, and BNSF also opposes House Bill 249. But I do want to emphasize a few points that, you know, just as with Union Pacific and their employees for BNSF, the most important thing that we do every single day is to operate safely and to make sure that everybody that works for BNSF goes home safely at the, at the end of the day. So I have deep respect and appreciation for the opinions of the, the proponents of this bill who are concerned about safety because it is the concern for every single person that works for BNSF. And it's the thing we start with every day. But this bill is not about safety. There, no data has been produced to suggest that it would be safer to require two people in the locomotive on every single train than other circumstances where it may be better at a very long train, for example, it may be more efficient and safer to have someone deployed on the ground as a conductor to address that. So without any analysis or data, the proponents of this bill are suggesting that the government just lock in the status quo and say, business, you and your employees can never agree that there's a better and safer way to do something. We're gonna do it like we're doing it today and we're never gonna, never gonna change. That's what this bill does. It just locks in the status quo without any evidence or data to support it. And finally, it's bad for Wyoming. You know, there are some states that have passed these bills in the last few years, California, Washington State, Illinois, Colorado, they've passed these bills. But states that depend on efficient transportation services to get their resources to markets are not passing this bill. Montana, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, they have not passed this bill. This would put the customers of rail transportation services in Wyoming at a significant long-term economic disadvantage and not allow the railroads any ability to improve over time as we have demonstrated a record of, of doing so. So again, I would please ask you to uh, consider voting no on this and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Jones, thank you for being here. Senators, questions for Burlington Northern, Santa Fe. Um, really appreciate it, Matt, thank you. Thank you very much. Please come forward. Thank you. We're going to get to everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, please state your name. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jody Levin on behalf of the Trona industry. The, the good news is uh, when you follow so many people, they have already said much of what you were going to say, so I promise they won't repeat any of that. The Trona industry does stand in opposition to House Bill 249. They are one of the customers that um, Mr. Jones just referenced. So they are the end uh, consumer that would pay for any cost increases uh, should, should um, you know, those, those costs flow, flow back down to the consumer. That, that's who gets impacted in this bill. Safety is absolutely important to the Trona industry. The Trona mines are recognized uh, as some of the safest mines internationally. They take safety as, as does the rail industry, incredibly important, and it's very serious to them. Uh, just two, two quick points I, I wanna make. As you've already heard, the, the contract before the, the railroads and the unions calls for two people on the train. And it can't be changed without agreement from not only the unions, but also the safety administrator. 
the idea that the state is going to come between that negotiation becomes a real point of concern for the Trona industry. Some of the Trona mines have unionized workforces as well. They negotiate safety decisions all the time. And now, you know, the, the idea that somehow the state knows better than the local managers working with their employees to figure out operationally what is best for the employees and what is best for the business, that's a real concern to the Trona industry. And they wanted me to, to make sure that I raised that point tonight. There's, you know, a, we often hear, you know, government closest to the people serves the people best. I think that same adage can be applied here that business decisions made locally between an employer and an employee serve employees and operations best. And so we'd ask for your opposition to House Bill 249 and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Any questions for Ms. Levin? Um, Jody, thank you very much for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next up, please come forward. Thank you for being here tonight. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Pat Joyce. I'm the Assistant Director of the Wyoming Mining Association. You've heard several references here earlier this evening um, regarding uh, coal mines and coal trains and, and that, and um, that would be our business. We, are, we represent 32 mines, operating mines within the state of Wyoming, as you're probably all well aware. And uh, that includes, of course, the coal, Bentonite, Trona, as was just mentioned, and, uh, and some uranium at that point. Um, three of our four minerals in this state rely heavily on the trains to transport our goods all around the world, whether it's to the, to the market within the states or next door to another state or, or to the ports. So we, we understand and we, we certainly couldn't get along without, without the railroads. They're very important to us. We are their end user. We depend on the competitive freight transportation to deliver those resources from our mines, of course, as I said, around the world. We've heard this bill tonight referred to as a jobs bill. We've heard it referred to as a safety bill. And we at WMA refer to it as a business bill. I could, uh, there's several things here I have written down, of course, and the same as Jody that I won't repeat that everybody else has repeated. We are, uh, very serious about keeping the negotiations between the railroads and the unions. We don't see uh, the benefit. We don't, we'd hate to see the state interject itself into these negotiations. When we run our businesses, whether it's your grocery store or uh, you know Wyoming Cat or any of the others that, that you've all been a part of, um, you wanna make, be able to make your own business decisions. And we don't see where that will cut into the uh, emphasis on safety. I think if you compared the mines, uh, I, I can tell you exactly, the mines are one of the uh, top four safest places to work in the United States. And you know, sometimes the grocery stores come in behind them. <laughs> I don't need to tease you, but <laughs> it's late. I know we're just picking on you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <She's boring. laughs> yeah, so. It's, it's late, there. you guys. I've just seen if you were awake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't even met yet. So. <laughs> um, he is, after all, a rookie. That's just. Yeah, that's well, just, I'd heard that earlier. There we so. go. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. That's fine. Sorry about getting off course here. But um, one thing was I've been with the Wyoming Mining Association for four years, and uh, the safety issue has been one that's been put on my plate along with education and a few other issues. And I find it to be absolutely impressive, the lengths that the mines will go to, to keep their miners safe and get them home every night. We spend a lot of money between WMA and the mines and that to, to make sure that's safe. It's no different with the, with the railroads. We all have that in common. That's not our point. Our point is that we would, uh, we've, we've opposed this bill in the past, we, will, we are opposing it here tonight, um, and we would respectfully ask for a no vote on this. Uh, we just would rather see the state not intervene 
and we would we would prefer that that negotiation stays between the railroads and the unions. With that, I'd stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Joyce, for your patience tonight being uh, here. Senators, questions for the Wyoming Mining Association. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you, you. Ms. Joyce. Appreciate it. <laughs> Further comments? Please come forward. Yeah, I see it by galley. You sit there long enough and it reminds you of being a legislator, right? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Stan Blake. I'm representing Smart Transportation Union at this possible at this time. And everyone who wants to talk about California passing it. Now, there's more states that have passed it. I guess that'll get your attention if you say California, but Kansas has a regulation. Wisconsin, West Virginia, states that introduced it are Nebraska. Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania. Lots of states are looking at this. The, the Union Pacific has gone on record say they want to go to one man crew. Lance Fritz, CEO, I have the quote if you'd like me to read it to you, but they want to go to one man crew. And we talk about positive train control and government interference. The railroads didn't voluntarily sign up for positive train control. It was shoved down their throats by the federal government because of a huge crash in Chatsworth, California. They killed numerous people. That's why there's positive train control. And it's finally in place in most of Wyoming, BNSF doesn't have positive train control on all its lines, as I'm sure uh, Conductor Caffey could attest to that. So government, forced positive train control on the railroads. It wasn't a voluntary thing. Uh, another spokesman for the UP said Amtrak has one engineer on it, their trains. Yes, they do. Anybody remember that horrific crash out of Philadelphia that killed, I don't know how many people, the engineer messed up going, I can't remember how fast around a 30 mile an hour curve. Uh, locomotives and cars don't stay on the track very long if you're going too fast. And uh, as you can see, I'm pretty wound up on this one. And, uh, and I work with the Union Pacific on safety issues. Uh, I've done uh, Zoom calls with them on issues that we have every day in Green River using handheld devices. It looks almost exactly like my phone that we do our switch list on. So I'm dedicated to safety. My house is also right next to the train tracks. I live on Railroad Avenue, so you can imagine. Uh, you probably sleep better at night not knowing what the Union Pacific and BNSF hauls through your town. At uh, Laramie, I think, is 40 miles an hour through town. Rock Springs is 40 miles an hour. Rollins is slower because they fuel there. But uh, Evanston is probably 40 miles an hour. A 40 mile an hour derailment is a mess. Uh, I found an interesting article from the Associated Press in dated January 1991. The railroad and trucking industries are fighting over whether Wyoming should allow triple trailer trucks on its highways. Truckers want the triples, which allow them to haul more goods at a lower price than double rigs do. Railroad officials call the rigs a threat to their industry and to safety. So I'm glad the railroad is concerned about railroad safety on the interstates. I'll keep going. Wyoming is a key state, said John Bromley, spokesman for Union Pacific Railroad. It represents a barrier to the trucking industry that wants to do long hauls. If Wyoming permits them, economics come into play, there would be a serious threat to the Union Pacific's operations. That was in 91. I hired out in 1990. My manager then, who's long since passed away, made sure I signed that petition to get that on the ballot. So that was a petition that... Uh, Citizens of Wyoming passed overwhelmingly, uh, 159,000 to 35,000, to not allow triple trailers on the interstates of Wyoming. Why? They're unsafe. I had a double trailer flip over right behind me driving over this morning, and I, I'm sure that guy's okay. I saw his face as he flipped over, and there were higher patrolmen right there. So they were concerned about safety then. They should be concerned about safety now. Two person on a crew 
is the safest route. Engineers have so much to do right now. The conductor is that other set of eyes when the engineer is looking at something. And Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you know where Rock Springs High School football field is. It's right next to the train tracks, not even 200 yards. In June last year, there was a derailment three miles, I think it's about three, three and a half miles east of Rock Springs coming into town. This train was equipped with positive crane control, but the crew noticed something wrong in front of them. It was a sun kink, or as the railroad doesn't like the term sun kink, they like thermal misalignment. It got warm enough that the track will actually move. When, when it gets cold, track will separate. When it gets hot, it expands. The crew saw that sun kink. Positive train control didn't see it. Positive train control can't see that. Positive train control can't see the little kids standing by the tracks there by the Rock Springs High School. They saw that in time to slow down the train. And I'm not sure how many locomotives and cars went over, but then it derailed. There was a huge fireball it was an ethanol car and uh, alcohol, I believe. But the crew saw that, slowed that train down and made it less of a disaster. And I, I shudder to think if that would have been next to the football field while there was a game going on. And uh, I'm just real passionate about this. I know you guys are gonna look at this seriously and odds are stacked up against this, but it is a safety issue. There is a moratorium on crew consist right now. The FRA recently tried to get rid of that. In fact, last testimony we had, it didn't make it over to the Senate. It kind of didn't leave uh, the Senator's desk. <laughs> so you guys didn't hear it last year. But the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration said, we are gonna rescind the two man crew re possible regulation and say we could go to one man crew, plus we preempt all state laws. Well, that was overturned by the Ninth Circuit of Court, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on February 23rd. And in the handout from uh, Wyoming Business Alliance, somebody handed me a copy. It talked about there might be appeal. I don't think there's gonna be a, an appeal. And a lot of the data that the railroad gets is from the Association of American Railroads. That's funded by the railroads. It's kind of like that group of uh, foxes and coyotes that said you don't need any wire around your chicken coops anymore because we have a study funded by foxes and coyotes. <laughs> so an, a study by the Association of American Railroads is funded by the railroads. So you can imagine what kind of data they're going to come out with. So I just wanted you to hear that part of my testimony and uh, I'm kind of rambling on. I didn't bring any prepared statement, but I fly from the hip a little better than I do reading from a statement and I'd stand for any questions you might have and hopefully you consider this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Blake, uh, you'll always be representative to me, but anyway, um, thanks for being here and for your passion for the issue. You can tell that we're taking this seriously. This bill wouldn't be in front of us if we didn't. And uh, uh, grateful for your comments. Uh, Senators, questions for Mr. Blake. Senator Anderson. Mr. Chairman, uh, was that one year ago or two years ago when we heard this before, when you and I walked out of the room together? Fact. <laughs> if you remember right. Rep Representative Blake. Mr. Chairman, through you. That was two years ago in the Jonah Center, in yeah, that yeah. glorious Senate transportation room we had there. Yes, that was okay. two years ago. Uh, House, Bill Senator 70, Pappas. House Bill 79, 2020. Really? Wow. A that that scares me when people can remember yeah. stuff like that. that yeah. That's just not right, you know what I mean? But um, thank you again, uh, Mr. Blake, for being here tonight. Um, Okay, anybody else in the room that would like to testify on House Bill 249? Please come forward. Let's keep going tonight and eventually we're gonna get everybody in.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Kevin Reddy, and I'm the president of the Federated Firefighters Wyoming. Um, I too am a Wyoming native and a graduate of NCHS. I won't say the, the year for risk of offense. Um, I've been working fighting fires in Wyoming for the last 21 years, spent the last 20 years uh, working as a lieutenant with the Cheyenne Firefighters, and we strongly support the railroad safety bill before you. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk about operations on trains. I'm not an expert. I won't go into that or business practices as far as safety concerns with the railroads and the customers. What I wish to uh, bring to your attention is having two competent members in a complex industry such as the railroads makes our job responding to hazardous materials, fires, and EMS calls on the railroad much easier. Um, these are complex industries uh, where the machinery takes skilled members to operate and you get a bunch of firemen in there trying to figure out how to get in and amongst trains without the assistance of uh, competent trained personnel, it makes our jobs a lot easier in responding to these life-threatening emergencies. So uh, we strongly encourage you to uh, support the bill and thank you for your time. Mr. Reddy, thank you. And uh, by the way, you have nothing to worry about when you graduated. Um, all of us can speak to that. So <laughs> you're still in good shape. Uh, any questions for the Federated Firefighters tonight? Okay, thanks, Mr. Reddy, appreciate it. Any Thank other you, testimony in the room tonight? Oh, Senator Mr. Chairman, Anderson. could we take a break? There's uh, something I need to do. Uh, let's take a, just 10 minutes. Let's take a five minute break right. and we'll come right. back. Um, I was trying to get through the room, but we're going to take a five minute break real quick. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, you do have a live mic in the room.
Okay, let's get started, everybody. He's going to get away before we introduce him. Okay, let's uh, let's settle in, everybody. And uh, I'm going to call forward anybody else who'd like to testify in the room tonight. Anybody else who would like to testify on House Bill 249? I think we're good in the room. Um, I'm going to go to, uh, let's go to Mr. Runyon. So Danielle, if you could let, uh, let Corey into the room tonight. Um, and then that we'll follow that up with uh, Ms. Leininger. Um, so Mr. Runyon, thank you for your patience tonight. Appreciate you sticking around and uh, welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just uh, really happy that you took the time to hear the bill and and what we have to say. Uh, my name is Corey Runyon. I am uh, the chairman for the Wyoming State Legislative Board, which is part of the Brotherhood Locomotive Engineers of Trainmen. <clears throat> um, you know, I uh, like to say that if we thought collective bargaining would fix this issue, uh, we would not be lobbying this bill. Um, and also I would like to say that as a locomotive engineer, um, I don't feel my job is at risk. Uh, I only have maybe eight years left on the railroad, hopefully, if uh, my pension is still there and my health. Um, but I know I cannot do this job by myself. Um, I have 24 years of work experience, five of those as a conductor and 20 as an engineer. In, in 2000, I started working as an engineer and I was a fireman. And at that time, a train length was 8,000 foot. And it now is up to 10,000 to 18,000 foot. So as you can imagine, we're responsible for a lot more. Um, I sent uh, the committee uh, uh, some of my own work experience of how I had a crossing incident in Owasco, or I mean uh, Oshkosh, Nebraska on the Powder River Basin but we had a motorcycle rider almost go under our train and I had to cut the train for emergency medical personnel. Um, also in that handout was a DP fire that happened this last year at Evanston or close to Evanston. Conductor off to meet uh, the fire department um, and was coordinated through the dispatcher. Um, I don't know how a, a rover would have met him that soon. Um, another uh, question is, we just had a snowstorm of about 30 inches. Um, I don't know how a vehicle would have drove a conductor out there uh, if a train broke down or if a crossing needed to be cut. Um, that conductor being there is important. Um, a lot of the things that people had said tonight uh, in support of the bill covered many of the things I was going to talk about. Um, I will tell you there are multiple screens now on a locomotive. Used to be you just looked and seen your speedometer, your airflow, and uh, the air going to the EOT, which is the rear end device. Uh, now you have DPs, which are slave units. Uh, you have your head in, which is A maybe a B set in the middle and C on the rear. Um, so you have a screen looking at your DPs, a screen looking at your regular train, and then a screen that looks at positive train control. Um, a dispatcher can call you at any time and give you uh, a mandatory directive for a speed slowdown and maybe some track that's been disturbed. You have to I have to physically go through the computer screen to find that written document. And as you can imagine, that is almost like texting and driving. I cannot look out um, in front of the train and what's coming ahead. And I really rely on the conductor to do that. Um, the trains and the airline industry are some of the most regulated uh, industries in the world and probably for good reason. Um, and I can just tell you, having to know all of the steps to secure a train, 
Um, if we go into emergency, uh, all the things you need to do, you really need that other person to talk to, um, to figure out how you're going to handle a situation. And it is very easy, even with two people, to miss a crucial step. Uh, I heard a lot of talk about safety. I, I, I believe this is honestly a safety issue. And I think the states have the right um, to regulate safety. Uh, a big thing that the carriers just talked about earlier was attendance. I would argue uh, knowing when we're going to work is probably the biggest safety issue that we face. We have no idea when we're going to work. And in today's society with this computers and them knowing what's going over the tracks, they should be able to put a good train line up together to let us know when we can be at work. A lot of times, like you heard the fatigue from one of the other individuals of an engineer falling asleep, that's because we have no idea when we're going to work. And just recently after this blizzard, I have worked every day since that blizzard has happened. And sometimes more than 12 plus hours. Um, I also be in the position I am send complaints on hours of service to the Federal Railroad Administration. I have several where crew members were on duty over 24 hours stuck out on a snowstorm. And I, I can't imagine what that would be like by yourself if you had some medical emergency. Um, PTC is just a safety appliance. Uh, we have a cab signals that used to tell us a light in the cab of the locomotive when you would go by a signal that light would come on telling you what signal you went by so you could remember it just a safety device really was never intended to take place of a crew member um you know i i think it's just really common sense the carriers like to say that there is no uh, numbers or figures that show that this is a safety issue. But when you look at what happened in Lee Magnique in Canada, well, it was a one man crew. He could have secured a train on a, a flat grade, but he couldn't cut a crossing because he was by himself. So he had to put that train on a grade and it had a locomotive fire after he secured it and went home or went to his hotel. And then when they put the fire out, for whatever reason, those brakes uh, released on that train, it rolled down in the middle of town and blew up the whole center of that town in Canada, killing 40 some people. Um, uh, you know, thank God these accidents don't happen often, but when they do happen on the railroad, it's not a good thing. The incident that my fellow coworker, Representative Blake, uh, talked about in Philadelphia, that incident was a one-man crew, or a, not a one-man crew, but a, a lone locomotive on the head end who is running at a high speed, and he has a short avenue to set brakes for a slow curve. Now, he was listening to the radio because somebody was throwing things at trains or shooting at them. So he was distracted by the radio, which... If a conductor was on the head end, they would have handled that. And he probably would not have missed, had his attention elsewhere and missed his slowdown for that curve. And a lot of those people wouldn't have got injured. Um, I think that I, I probably said all that I can. I, I just hope you realize that we do think that this really is a safety issue and um, hope you will support House Bill 249 Railroad Safety. Thank you, and I will stand for questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Runyon, and thanks uh, for your patience uh, staying with us tonight. We appreciate your uh, comments. Committee, anything for Mr. Runyon? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to uh, Ms. Leininger next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Monica Leininger, speaking on behalf of Powder River Basin Resource Council and our members. 
For those of you that we haven't had the pleasure of meeting in person yet, our organization's founding members include far family farmers and ranchers with historic roots in the Powder River Basin. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in front of you this evening. Very briefly, Mr. Chairman, our membership strongly supports this bill. Railroads are an integral part of Wyoming's economy, infrastructure, and industries. These railroads travel throughout the state on our farms, ranches, pristine landscapes, and communities. We feel that the committee should support this legislation and make clear that we continue to hold the highest standards for safe development and transportation of our natural resources. And Mr. Chairman, on a personal note, throughout my life, I've lived in three Wyoming railroad towns. I'm from Casper, go Mustangs, and I've lived in Laramie and Cheyenne. And as you can see, I like to spend a lot of time in Thermopolis as well. As a state that sees as much transportation of vital resources as Wyoming, I feel that this bill makes it clear that we want to do everything we can to ensure, ensure their safe transportation. So our organization and strongly ask the committee to move forward with the bill and bring it the floor for the rest of the body to consider and I'll stand before you with any questions. Ms. Leininger, thank you. It's good to see you in transportation. Having uh, worked with you the last couple of years on corporations, it's, it's good to see you. Thanks for your patience and uh, for staying with us tonight. Questions of the Powder River Basin Resource Council tonight? Any questions? Thank you, Monica, appreciate it. Okay, do we have anyone else? Uh, Danielle, I'm not showing any hands raised. Uh, anyone Mr. else uh, who would like to testify tonight on Zoom? No, I believe you're correct. We do not have anyone else on Zoom. Okay, thank you. And I wanna recognize Representative Sweeney is here. Also, uh, who just came in the room, Representative Ramon Martinez, Mero. or Merrill Martinez, my mistake. Um, Representative Sweeney, do you want to testify tonight or are you just joining us for the educational part of things? You can't pass up an opportunity to testify. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make sure uh, Senator Anderson stayed awake. Yeah, so, yeah there you go. Um, All right. Well, but, good deal. Uh, um, uh, we got him a break, so I think he's good yeah, you know, for a little while. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, several years ago, I was uh, against this bill, but last year I changed um, changed my mind and totally saw it as as a safety measure. And uh, uh, so I uh, would leave you with that that um, I am in support and uh, uh, realize that that doesn't make everybody happy, but um, just uh, the way I, I saw it uh, last year and I still am committed to that. So thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Thanks for being here tonight, Representative. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, Representative Romero Martinez, thanks for being here too. And do you have anything that you'd like to testify? Come forward. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I want to, first of all, say thanks for welcoming me. And I am in support of this bill, uh, 249, is it? And my uh, my experience is a little bit different. Uh, Representative John Romero Martinez, and I am in favor of this bill because I was born in Cheyenne but I was raised on a railroad section for most of my life until about the age of 14 or 15 when we migrated to Cheyenne. And so I have always been in favor of a bill like this, which never existed until I think 20 years ago, I went to a joint or a transportation committee meeting in the Senate uh, side when they used to have committee meetings up in the third floor, I think. And I thought this was already taken care of, uh, apparently not. Next thing you know, I'm on labor health and social service and the bill comes through. I didn't have to read the bill. I already knew what it was about by the title, the two man crew thing. And you've probably heard testimony similar to what we heard. My dad was a railroad worker for 33 years on the Union Pacific Railroad. 
And I remember him coming home really angry one day after a derailment. And he said, well, this is what happens. I said, what do you, what do you mean? This is what happens when the railroad cuts corners. What do you mean? First, they get rid of the caboose. Now they're trying to get rid of the brakeman. Next thing you know, they're going to want a one-man crew. And I quote my dad, who has since went on the journey to heaven. And that incident that took place just west of Cheyenne, and two people died. And if you look at the details, and nobody answered me in committee there, I could tell you I'm willing to bet that it had to do with air brakes. And I'm willing to bet, I'm even willing to bet my life, that's big, huh? That it had to do with air brakes. Because I know everybody that worked on the railroad from here, hither to yonder, everybody from Harriman. And, and this bill went through proper vetting, went through our process in the house, and now it's to you guys. And it is surprising to me that we still don't have some, we have technology of a, we're going to Mars and we can put a rocket up in the air and do a crew and then come back down and land the same deal. And we still don't have ejector pods for trains or we don't have, we have not evolved in the technology of trains. I don't want to belabor the issue. I just, I really don't, I, I really think it is a, it's a, it's a safety issue and it's a quality of life issue. And it, Someone might make the argument that it has something to do with a labor dispute. It's not a labor dispute. It's a safety dispute that goes back to the time when I was a little child, where the trains that used to pass me were probably not, but if you look at the Harriman section on a Google, you see where those houses used to be before they demolished and destroyed the community. I'm an exact, they told me you're a, you're, you are a endangered species in three ways. I said, how? They're gonna get rid of the sections eventually. They're not just a two man crew to get rid of this. They've already done that. Now we farm people out through PTI or whatever and that's how they get them there. I went to a rural school, Willardson, which was population 20. Now that's like population one. So this is what happens when the five children that lived in Harriman, Tammy, Joyce, Bernadette, John, there was like five of us and we all went to Willardson. So look at the effects also of what destroying sections do of what taking an extra man off does. <clears throat> Even people who are, you know, piloting submarines or airplanes don't rely on one person. If God forbid something happens to the one person, what happens to that one person? Is the computer gonna save his life? Or is it just because the glossy flyer says that safety is better because less people die? That doesn't mean that we've made a better community. So I think we have to look at this as a human issue. I support this bill. I digress. Thank you for listening. Representative, uh, sorry I mispronounced your name earlier. It's nice to have you here, and thank you for taking time to come by. We're, no problem. We do appreciate it. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions of the good representative? Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Okay, committee, uh, I'm going to close public testimony tonight on this bill, and uh, what's your pleasure? Is there is there I, any motion on the bill, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Senator Pappas. Uh, yes, I uh, first of all I'll move the bill. I uh, I, I want to tell you I'm I'm a little conflicted. Uh, I you know I I the reason why I knew the House bill before is because I Senator oh. just real quickly. Uh, generally, I don't as a committee chairman require a second. Oh yeah, um, and so Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to require a second. Uh, let's go to let's go to uh, yeah. your comments so, on the, so on so. The bill. Um, you know, I, I was on I was a uh, uh, senator or representative of Blake's bill in 2020. That's the reason I remember the bill number is because I was co-sponsor, um, and and uh, you know a, a lot I've learned a lot since then. I still. I think it's it's really a multifaceted bill. It's not only just safety. I believe it is a safety bill, but it is also a labor bill, and it's all of those things put together that we discussed tonight. And and um, I do have issues of of um, 
us getting in, into further regulation. There is a reason for regulation though. Um, and so there is, there is my inherent conflict. And the reason I moved this bill is, I don't know if, if it got to the floor, how I would eventually vote. But I feel that um, I should vote to take it to the floor for, for a floor discussion so that 30 of us can discuss it rather than five. So uh, again, uh, I move the bill. Okay, thank you, Senator. Uh, further, further discussion on this bill. Um, and then we'll take a look at it uh, for any amendments. Anybody else have any comments on the we need a on the on the bill? Um, I had indicated, Kim, that we wouldn't take seconds on this committee. Uh, we're used to doing that, um, but some committee chairmen don't require it since there's only five senators. Uh, we just we just move it and we go ahead into discussion. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I don't need a second for us to consider the bill. So mm, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, anything else? Let's work the bill. Um, are there any, any amendments, anything? Um, the committee, I'll, I'll just uh, finish up consideration of the bill this way. I. I really appreciate the effort that went into this. Appreciate it, Representative Clifford, for you bringing it. Uh, uh, Representative Blake, you and I go a long ways back. Uh, appreciate everything about your testimony and um, and appreciate business being here tonight. Um, we've learned a lot along the way. I, I have not gotten to where I can support the bill. I just, I think, I just think, uh, that we're in, injecting ourselves somewhere where we really don't belong. And um, uh, so that's kind of where I'm at tonight. I just, I can't get there, but uh, that's me. So are you ready for question on the bill? Yes, sir. Kim, would you please take roll on uh, House Bill 249? Roll call vote for House Bill 249 engrossed. Senator Anderson? No. Senator Furphy? No. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Chairman Landon? No. Three ayes. I mean, sorry. Three no's, two ayes. Um, okay. Fails. The, the bill fails. Thank you, Kim. Uh, <clears throat> uh, are you uh, good with amendments and bills uh, previous to this one? And um, do you have anything for the committee before we depart tonight? Uh, I just would like to call your attention to the handouts they gave you for the committee meeting on Thursday for the interim, the joint interim, and the topics that were shared. I think you might have gotten a um, Pretty short list. an email on that, but I thought I would give them to you in print. And that meeting again is Thursday at noon. It will be in um, on the House side. So uh, it looks like Ms. Lankford is, um, is interested in that topic, whether this bill goes all the way through or not on the non-resident piece. Um, and like I said, committee, I, um, we're not, we're not going to be bound by last Friday. If, if we've got an issue that we want to take up as a transportation committee, uh, we'll talk about it and, and I'll, take it forward if we consider it a priority. So it's just an awfully early deadline for our interim topics. And, um, and that kind of handcuffs us a little bit, so. Okay. Mr. Chairman, did you want to go ahead and schedule a meeting for Wednesday for interim topics then? We, uh, we can't do the one thirty as you and I talked. We, we had another meeting for school facilities come into the mix. Um, we're going to have a quick meeting to abide by quarterly meetings that are in the statutes. And so uh, that takes uh, Senator Pappas and me out of that free. But okay. uh, we could committee meet upon adjournment, but I'm not sure that we would really need to discuss as a Senate committee any of our priorities for the for the interim unless you feel like we we want to do that. Do we have um, any business on Wednesday? 
we don't. We we don't have any bills. Um, I I guess um, if if we wanted to prioritize the one or two items uh, among ourselves and make sure that we vote accordingly, um, I'd be fine with that. But I don't think we're going to have so many topics that we can't Discussion. just work with our house counterparts and and, and handle it then. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Maybe on Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Why, yeah. why hash it twice? That's what I'm thinking. So. Yeah. So Kim, I guess unless something changes dramatically tomorrow, I think I think we're good. Uh, th there's a chance, you guys, since some of those committees are backed up a little bit. Um, I think uh, Chairman Anderson has maybe three bills left. A couple of those committees still have quite a few bills, so we could get a re-referral. And if we do, we might need to uh, we might need to take one up. But I I don't I'm not getting that indication. So. So this notice here that you put out is not, we're not going to meet on Thursday. We are going to meet Thursday. Yes, that's, oh, yeah. our, that's our interim that, that, topic. That's meeting. a joint committee. That's the joint committee oh, meeting. Oh, okay. Yep. That's, uh, that's the interim topic meeting. We'll go across the hall that day and, uh, and meet with the. Uh, okay. Anybody else feel like? Are we, still, yep. are we still on? Yep. Mr. Chairman, would you like me to end the YouTube stream?